Sunday, Sunday. So good to be Sunday, Sunday. It's for fun history. Sunday, Sunday. Hello, everybody. How we doing? Let's see. Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. Hello, everyone. How we doing? Oh. oh. Hello. Sorry for you. I'm still getting over it. I've been run rugged for the last week. It's funny. While you're doing it, you don't feel tired. While you're doing it, you're running on adrenaline and fun and all the other stuff. Moment is over. You're going, oh my lord, how did I ever survive? So, in good news, books I have new. Five. Five books. Several new to me books down there, as I explained. But uh, five new books to review. Um, three, well, one maritime. Two medieval and two naval. They're all pretty cool books, though. One arrived far better in pa uh, far worse in packaging than the others did, but yeah, hey ho. Also, I'll point out that my pop out shelf, the um, the balsa wood that tends to stop it going too far back and too far forward, has disappeared. Which is always fun. So if you suddenly hear me go gong, 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 bong, bong, that's probably because there's things have flopped away. And well, yeah. What can I say? It's been a rather fun time. It has been. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Night Six Eight Three One. Hello, Peter Dawson. Would you agree with Hood with a 5 torpedo broadside with overkill? As Hood's original torpedo battery was 10, according to Ari Burt's Battleship British Battleships, 1919-1913. Honestly, but no. Um, reading through all your stats there about the options, I would never have placed a torpedoes over the main strength girder, because, as the NC pointed out, they could have broken the ship in half. But also, I would have to say that if I was going for a large battery for Hood, I would probably have tried to go for two triple above, triple above deck launchers, because... <sighs> this is going to sound strange. I always prefer an above deck launcher to a below deck launcher, not because it is in less capable, in broad speaking terms, you can really do a lot of thing with a below deck uh, things with a below deck launcher, but with an above deck launcher, especially if you create a reloading mechanism system, um, which can be fitted in a larger ship, you can A, avoid having such a huge space in your hull, deep inside, you know, that will that can fill with water, and B, you can have, you can have your flood prevention, your torpedo prevention, be more contiguous. It won't have piercings for torpedoes. It's kind of like today, we don't like to have portholes. And the reason we don't have portholes is because of the whole thing of maintaining air pressure inside a hull when we're trying to maintain pressure at a sufficient level that it, it becomes, MB, well, as NBC secure as you can under those circumstances. So that automatically things don't flow into the ship, they flow out of the ship. Hello, Senator Canera. Hello, everyone. Happy Easter. Hello, DG40. Hello, Deathly Kozian. Hello, Abzaski. Hello, Dan Freeman. Hello, The Shrike. Hello, Timu Loka. Hello. Ooh. Second, what was the most important sinking of the day? Moscow or the USS the Sullivans? Um, well, speaking as someone who's been trying to get aboard the Sullivans, the Sullivans annoys me more as more than the Mo Moskva, and I also have to point out the Sullivans was probably more preventable than the Moskva. 
Theoretically, the Mosca was preventable, but as someone pointed out to me, she hadn't had the latest upgrades on her S300s. So, pretty much all her systems, anything coming in at less than 25 meters height above the water, is possibly going to go straight underneath what her missiles can engage at. Which would be quite not good. So the midships is the midships torpedo tubes. Mm hmm. Anything a midships is not good with torpedoes. Antana Verka. Hello, Yikas. Hello, Stephen Richards. Hello, Mini 1640. Broken watch chip in half. Uh, HMS Hood. This is a torpedo discussion. That's right. Would it have been better to remove both the submerged and all the L8 land above water to be choose from hood during construction? And what benefits does that bring? Well, during construction, you're not limited by treaty, so... Yeah. What can you use that weight for, basically? Uh... No real benefits, because you're not going to fit extra guns or use it, you know, that tonnage is not going to make you fit extra guns or anything. And the, the most the most powerful thing they could have done, which again with Hood, would seem rather obvious. And would have definitely if they'd done it with an appropriate armor upgrade and been less bothered about the speed, maybe been happy with, I don't know, 30 knot speed, she then would have truly been a the first fast battleship rather than a battle cruiser, which is what she was. Arguably, because you'd have had to do some structural changes around the design to actually make her be able to accommodate more armor, etc. So that would have given her more subdivision, subdivision which would have made her more, more towards battleship than battle cruiser spectrum or cruiser spectrum in terms of subdivision. Would have been if you'd given her four triple turrets. We can all think, what would HMS Hood have been like with 12 15 inch guns rather than eight? There's also the reality that if she had had 12 15-inch guns, then the U.S. Navy would have been really royally scared of her. Dan Freeman, stop getting into worms discussions. Sounds like someone, something fluffy is wandering around outside my door. And by fluffy, I mean fluffy with an assistant, not fluffy without one. Oh, yeah. I thought you were wandering around outside my door. Oh, they... That's terrible fluff. However, will we save you? Yeah, there was someone cruelly, cruelly being restrained outside my door. That wasn't fair at all, was it? You're going to jump up or you're going to torch my feet? Oh, I don't know. Mm hmm. Okay. AV Enterprise. Hello, AV Enterprise. Um. Oh. Um, right then. Yeah. I said again, I heard the Russians claim the start US when the DG um sixty eight Burke class was once sunk. No, unfortunately it wasn't. It's the older ship, which is the lovely destroyer, which is there preserved and was there to be it was it was something I was going looking forward to going to look at and still hope to go look at. Yes, it is the trainee assistant, fluffy research assistant. Um, Absolutely. Can an S300 detonate on a small drone? Mm, yeah, it can. It, well, it can detonate. It's going to sound something. The S300 has several different methods of making sure it detonates when it's supposed to. And if you are run the right one for the right scenario, it should. 
in theory, rather like someone else here who's trained to do certain things, should in theory, uh, go off at the right point and take out the drone. Although, I will say, it's very expensive. It's kind of like, and I put this politely. So, if I want a squirrel chase down my garden, I have a choice. I can ignore the squirrel, I can deploy the Tafra, or I can deploy the Fluffy Research Assistant. Now, usually, I just ignore the squirrel because, honestly, it doesn't worry me that much. It doesn't worry me. But it does worry my Fluffy Research Assistant. Now, the thing is, then the, ta the Fluffy Research Assistant has the choice. Run himself, which is a lot of energy cost to himself, or let this one out. And I kid you not, the Fluffy Research Assistant tends to deploy to Tafra, so he doesn't run after run after the squirrel himself. When I say deploys, I mean literally opens the door, sits down by the door while this one chases it. Seriously, my do I have a dog who's decided that he has a dog, so why bark himself? Using an S300 to shoot down a drone basically means that you've got no other option and it's going to be incredibly expensive vis-a-vis -vis the cost of the drone. Dean Richards, what's better, Hedgehog or Squid, and why? Um, Hedgehog has more rounds, but Squid's rounds are heavier. So the thing is, the Hedgehog's rounds will tend to do damage, but might not sink an enemy, an enemy submarine. But the, uh, um, the actual rounds of the squid will sink a submarine if they, cut, if they come within the kill zone. <laughs> Hello, new IQB4472. Uh, da -da -da. Mm -hmm. Hello, Sage. No, seriously, would it be fair to think of HMS Tiger's Battle Cruiser 9 inch main belt and 6 inch upper belt armor as inadequate by the end of the 1920s? Um, not. Yeah, it's adequate for the Battle Cruiser role, not adequate for the capital ship role. And that's the other thing you have to remember by the 1920s. You cease to have Battle Cruisers and Battle Ships, you have capital ships. And where you have to, where you're only allowed tonnage, the tonnage can only, you know. You can't build battle cruisers as well as battleships. You can only build capital ships. And you have to make a case if you're building a battle cruiser why you don't need another battleship. <laughs> what method of detonation does it have that's sensitive enough that would trigger on a small drone? Um, for some of the older S300s, they have command detonation. Which can be used, and for some of the other newer ones, I think they still have the radar proximity. It depends on the warhead and depends on the generation of the S three hundred we're talking about. Dan Freeman, Killzone isn't playing well with some demographics. Can we say cuddle area? Um, that there is no. The trouble is, if you describe a cuddle area with a fluffy research in the room, there is no cuddle area. Everywhere is a cuddle area, and if he sees you, he can cuddle you. You want the fluff for cuddling? No, I'm not. I'm just checking. Oh, he's fine. You know what? I'll leave him with you while I finish. Oh, he'll come with you because he is. Let's put it this way: he's doing his um, biological um, uh, alert system of "I need to go to the garden," uh, but he also down. wants to come in here. You listen down because he can't. He can jump. But... He can jump, but I'd rather not have the hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, you know, you're spoiling him. He's a good boy, though. You, you, you. Yes. Go on. Go on. I, your for hours. I know he has been guarding my iron brew very well. He's a he very good. About the 
he's very good at protecting my iron brew. Yeah, the Tafra has appointed himself the Iron Brew Guard. He spends half his life, whenever Iron Brew arrives, he curls up round the bottles to look after it. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to. I'm, I'm, I'm putting my drink down here, but I sh probably shouldn't, because, as I said, the balsa wood has disappeared. So I could well have a crash bang and a wallop very shortly. And if the fluffy researcher system was in here, that shelf would be gone by now. Do you you have accounts of Hedgehog detonating on the hull submarine and sub diving? I've not come across any some accounts. Hedgehog, if it actually the thing is about Hedgehog is it needs to get in contact with the hull in order for it to sink the sub. The squid was a large enough round; it didn't need to. It actually had a kill zone, so it didn't need to actually get in contact with the hull. Um, there are accounts of ships being of hedgehog being fired at subs and in missing. So that's why they basically developed squid because, honestly, hedgehog is using rounds which aren't that much bigger than the anti-submarine bomb, the AS bomb, which the fleet air arm had had at the beginning of World War Two which were proved interesting to ineffective. Basically, the AS bomb, the, the, and this is... To quote one observer writing a report about the anti-submarine bomb at the time, that it would have only been effective had the enemy submarine been on the surface with all its doors open, and they'd been able to drop the bomb directly through the doors. Then it would work. Mm -hmm. And on the Melanie's, uh, on also on the accounts of Hedgehog, etc. Um, I'm just putting together together a proposal to or go to Osprey for writing a book on basically a day in a life of a flower class Corvette. I've got a few uh, more. It's a few, bit more developed than that in sort of ideas, but I'm. I'm on Meg's draft. I did promise actually to get the draft finalized while I was away with the with the um, revision camp, but that didn't happen. But that is a sort of a little sort of how, how do I put this? Not going to be a long a long book. It'll be a, not a massively long book, but it has meant that I've been looking at a lot of it, hedgehogs and squids and all their systems and trying to figure out exactly when I'm going to pitch the year for it. I know when I'd like to pitch the year, I'd like to put it in 1942. Because that's the big year. But it'll be interesting. That's it. So what might Russian's version of Sink the Bismarck, basically Russia's Revenge of Moscow, look like? Um, I would not want to be anywhere near Kiev. Kiev. I'm fairly certain at a certain point there's going to be a lot of firepower raining down on it. Seriously, <laughs> <laughs> Ranger was in the Pacific, yet she was used around Norway. Why the same dangers? It was actually felt that it was safer in a versus Norway than it was in the Pacific. Because in the Pacific, you were conducting carrier versus carrier battles, and Ranger really wasn't strong enough for that. Yet in Norway, she could do... And this is the thing. In Norway, you could do a hit-and-run strike. Which the British were using things like Furious 4 and other, sec uh, other carriers, which by this point were second-line ships. And Ranger fitted in quite happily with them. Stafford. They don't realise I give them extra treats. I know I do it on camera, but they don't watch this that often. And the cousins who do, it's our secret, isn't it? They're all good cousins.
Yes, sir. What would have to change technology and technologically and simultaneously for the battle cruiser to obsolete the battleship as the world's most important asset? Okay. So here's the thing. Arguably, the battle cruiser was already the Royal Navy's most important asset, which is why the Royal Navy was actually building the admirals, then followed up by the G3. So the ships they were actually building by the end of World War Two, World War One, were all battle cruisers, because battle cruisers were good for wide ocean operations and basically the sea control, in terms of exercising sea control, commerce, denial, trade protection, all those things, emissions. However, that, of course, depends on you having the control of the sea granted to you, the command of the sea granted to you by the battle fleet, which has basically a dem denied access to the wider ocean of the, uh, from the uh, high seas fleet and all the other things. So, what would it take for battle cruisers, or, you know, even as it were, fast battleships, what they were, RM was building, by World War II standards, anyway. Um, to replace them, battleships, number, uh, number one? Well, A, you're going to end up with something like a fast battleship design if you are going down replacing the battle cru battleship with the battle cruiser route. It's going to end up somewhat more armoured and somewhat more survivable, but it's going to be emphasised around speed and firepower with more armour than a battle cruiser traditionally has, but not as much armour as a battleship has, probably. So you're going to end up with something not far off a of fast battleship. What are the areas where that comes in? Well, I think it's interesting to note that it's the Carrier Battle Cruiser Task Force, which the RN starts working on in the 1920s and 1930s, for trade protection, for commerce warfare, for all those things. They're looking at teaming up their battle cruisers and their aircraft carriers. And I think if naval aviation had been slightly more solid and slightly larger, then you would have seen that happen. One of those interesting things, if you start sort of thinking of converting an Admiral class to an aircraft carrier or a G3 to an aircraft carrier and working through and getting a few Admirals converted maybe to G3s, you know. The classic scenario I tend to give people is what happens if the RN converts all three Admirals? Two aircraft carriers, and all three, uh, and also has courageous, glorious, and furious, and has all those six as the core of their aircraft carriers, along with Hermes, along with Argus, along with Eagle. You know, so they have three cruiser carriers, three what? Let's be honest, furious, courageous, and glorious in this scenario become fleet carriers and three strike carriers. To use the RN sort of phraseology that starts developing the interwar period. That would have been a very interesting thing because you'd have got the strike carriers being partnering up with the battle cruisers. Each one of them would have partnered up with, with Hood, Renown, or Repulse. And those would have been your three critical, fast, rapid reaction task groups. Your fleet carriers. Well, you would probably have ended up with those taking on the bulk of the Mediterranean operations, but they would be partnering up with the battle with the Queen Elizabeth. So they would be in the Mediterranean. And then the cruiser carriers would be deployed as they were. And that would have given the Royal Navy very much an incentive for speed. Because if they've got larger naval aviation assets and they've got more aircraft and they managed to get aircraft... Let's say, the, under those circumstances, the fleet air arm stays as part of the Royal Navy. Maybe in a reduced level, maybe it gets sh uh, halved off, i.e. the land bombers, etc. get given to the Royal forming, forming of the Royal Air Force, but the single-seat aircraft, the smaller aircraft that are going for the carriers get maintained as part of the fleet air arm. At that point, I think you probably do end up with a fleet air arm which is more cognizant, more... Uh, fought more powerful than it is, probably still has fought through. I'd be surprised if Night Strike still is emphasized as much, which could lead to again the RN still having biplanes in service by the time World War II began, because long range stable flight 
using technologies available in the 1930s, you're still looking at a biplane, but it would be probably a more powerful engine biplane. So goodness knows what kind of swordfish it would be. But under those scenarios, I do see a battle more of a battle cruiser style ship being more useful to DRN than a far than the battleship end of the bat fast battleship construction. How am I done here, right? Run. Ooh. Hi, George Newman. Ian Winter. Just watch the, your UAM on a forward uh, against rear main guns. Um, would the Germans better uh, been better for with two with a two eleven inch triples forward and twin five one inch aft, or as they all said and done are six inch? Yeah, that would have been a fairly good mixture for them, for especially for their um, Deutschland class. That's what I've been playing around with. By the way, I found a way I can buy cans of iron brew right here in Samia. Cool for you. Uh, Jeff Beeler, you lucky friend. Canned iron brew is always lovely. Um, honestly, my uh, I, the, only reason I, the reason I buy bottles rather than cans is the sheer quantity I drink. Uh, but for me, it always goes um, the quality of iron brew you get in pubs and hotels which serve it. You know, it's just it's so good from the syrup with the soda water mix. It's just then there, and uh, some of the best I've had was on Jersey. Jersey, beautiful island. And then it goes cans, and then it's bottled stuff. Although 1901 ranks above probably the cans. And that comes in glass bottles. So anyway, has a nation ever lost a capital ship to a nation of our navy? Uh, there's been a few nations which have lost first and second rates to um, uh, well-fortified Sports, but uh, it's rare. Hi, George Newman. Right, right, given the danger of fire to ships, why are we so focused on sinking them? Because it sounds cooler. <laughs> Danny anyway, Wright, you teased us with some alternate designs for the York class cruisers. When are you doing a video on those ordnance? As said in my UAD video yesterday, I'm currently delayed with some ales, and it's because now I'm able to play around with the beam and the draft. <laughs> I can play around with the beam and the draft. And that is tempting me. I'm working on that. Mm-hmm. That's Taking what you said about flipping uh, flipping outcomes, we we don't like on its head. If Hood got all on the BBs of Israel, what lessons do we take away from the battle? Oh, if. Hood had golden battle a uh, BB the ba Bismarck, it would have been <laughs> oh good lord the crowing Hood would have definitely been upgraded at that point, and Hood would have immediately ascended to a similar level as Warspite. Um, probably would have been far harder to get rid of, and Hood might have actually survived long enough to be preserved. Andrew Report, alternate history question. It's a Japanese. You can retain the Ibiki class armor cruisers, battle cruisers. Part of watching the inventory. How could they best make use of them? Refit to increase speed? Replace them. Basically, use their. Uh, if they're allowed to replace, retain them as part of their tonnage allowance, use that tonnage to re allowance to build something new. 
Donovan, what's the difference between squid and limbo? Ooh. Well, squid are sort of a form of marine life, and limbo is normally something, well, we either refer to as being in limbo or in limbo dancing, where you go underneath a pole. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. Uh, the difference between squid and limbo it really is the size of charge and the range. Um, limbo has a greater angle of engagement versus squid. Why? What is it with some military news outlets calling more ships like Moscow, Cla Moscow Cruiser and others battleships that are cruise act or just warship? I'm just ignorant or don't care. Uh, the latter. They're mostly they're ones which have been talking about land-based warfare for so long they don't know sea warfare anymore. Jeff Hiller, what effects did the uh, and lend lease on Fleet Arm? How did the uh, Fleet Arm adapt to the changes? Uh, they had plenty of their own designs, and basically Fleet Air Arm adapted to the changes by A, they're reducing the number of carriers in the service anyway, and B, bringing up those which air groups which were based on British aircraft. Which is kind of sad. Can you recommend a good reference work on World War II, Atrus Ajax? I'd like to know more about it. It was one of my grandfather's billets. The most he said is that the mooring quarter in Britannia, uh, the mooring quarters in Britannia are the same as Ajax. Hmm. Um, let me just check if his book has come out yet. Um, oh, his book's not come out yet. Um, Ian Ballantyne, I know he, he's done London, he's done War Spite, he's done Rodney, he's done Killing the Bismarck, and Bismarck itself. He's done lots of books about submarines, and I know... I, I do I do know I I'm sure I've heard him say he's got a book coming up on Ajax. I'm not sure if he's writing it right now. I'm not sure if he's just planning it, but I know we discussed it at some point. And therefore, I would say wait for that because if anyone's going to do a good book, he will. He's going to come if it's going to be coming. Hmm. It's always fun. But yeah, Ian is always a usually a good source to go to. You can get his book on any particular topic. You're doing you're in a good you're in a good place. Bada bang. Danny Wright, the Japanese in 1942 were using fishing boats for pickets in East Japan for early warning. Could Admiral Kimmel have done this before Pearl Harbor? This was just an instrument price. He could have if he'd been allocated the money. And again, I, it's not something I don't want people to think that the Americans didn't look at. They were looking at is getting the money out of the politicians for it. Um, Moscow was a cruiser, and I'd say, considering its firepower in modern, uh, in modern stage, it's certainly... Are up there in the capital ship rankings. Would it? I'd say it's a first-rate capital ship. No, but definitely a, a, a second-rate at least. Definitely capability, and also especially as it carried nuclear weapons. But it does kind of remind me more and more of um, the discussions we've had on the Andromeda class, on the Andromeda and the Glorious Heritage class.
Listen, capital ships used to be some of the ones that stood in the line of battle. Since we don't do that anymore, what makes something capital ship? Actually, no. Okay, uh, line of battle ships were sometimes referred to as capital ships, and battle ships, of course, were referred to as capital ships and battle cruisers. But honestly, capital ships does not mean it's a line of battle vessel. You could be a line of battle vessel, but not a capital ship. But conversely, you cannot be a capital ship and not a line of battle vessel. An air, oh, well, let's be honest, an aircraft carrier is also considered a capital ship asset. Basically, a capital ship is any warship, and this is a critical point, any warship which is of strategic deployment value. And by this you mean, it's a warship which is going, its deployment is going to require authority from higher political authority. I, you can't just assign battleships and cruise uh, battleships and aircraft carriers around the world to the various fleets without telling the politicians what you're doing. You just can't. Now, if you're the Norwegian Navy, their frigates are their capital ships because honestly, if the admiral turned around to the prime minister of Norway and went, "You know what? I've deployed these all our ships to the Pacific, and hey, I haven't told you." The Prime Minister of Norway would probably get pretty upset. Whereas in Britain, if an admiral said, well, we ha one of the frigates, we ta we've tasked frigates for deployments and there's one moving this way and this way as part of our routine operations. Uh, sir, and uh, so, when, you know, so they're already there when the minister needs them. The minister's not going to be upset. However, if the minute if they turn around and said, "We've already deployed a carrier battle group with all this to this area, and we haven't seen fit to deploy you," holy guacamole! So, capital ships are capital assets. They're strategic assets which are coordinated from the capital. Reading Jonathan Burrow. Vision, beam and draft. Was there a very recent uh, UAD update? Update, yeah. <laughs> Danny Wright, I was referring to the Royal Navy alternative designs for York in the 1920s. Oh yeah, I've got them. I'm working on that. Uh, my preferred option for a, one is a two triple turret. Because if you're going to go for six eight inch guns, you might as well go to down to two triple turrets. I think. Why did the Royal Navy keep putting torpedo tubes on battleships and battlecruisers after Jutland? They were very pointless dead weight. Uh, because the Royal Navy likes battle cru uh, torpedoes. Honestly. <sighs> Let's put it this way. Some things we can change quickly within an institution. Some things take a long time to change within an institution. Torpe the Royal Navy's and various departments' love affair with torpedoes is going to take a long time. Oh, sorry. Did I say there was a difference in explosive charge between Squid and Limbo? I thought they used the same bombs. Um, <clears throat> let's put it this way. They are theoretically the same, but they're evolutions of each other, and the, the actual explosive power from the charge achieved in Limbo tends to be far greater than that achieved by Squid. Almost as if someone's been playing around with the chemistry. Dimitris, can you do a long patrol on Captain Johnny Walker and his ASLD work? I could do, yes. As Vox said, did galleons travel and fight with their galley contemporaries? I can see issues with trying to keep them organized and together in transit. They did, and there were lots of issues. The, Span the Spanish Armada includes galleys. There's a long period where they do combine up, and they are interesting to organize together. I was like, okay, what is the possibility of Atrium's victory ever being restored to the same condition? Uh, not going to happen, the amount of work they've done into preserving her in dock condition. Uh, honestly, they'd, it'd be probably cheaper to build a new one. It will be cheaper to build a new one. Alright, Brozok, so have you made penance sword enough money to justify their faith in you? I hope so. 
I hope they'll be interested in my next big book. As said, it's I'm working on that one, but that's going to take a while. Whereas I'm hoping I can get this sort of little idea. I ha I, I I was approached by someone to see if I'd be interested in writing it, and they're very nice. And I went, hmm, that sounds like a cool idea, and I think I can get a, especially as I'm going to be seeing Sackville during my June trip. That seemed rather appropriate, so yeah. <laughs> so, well, the next time I'm at the Kennedy War Museum, I'm going to ask them how come they're not stocking a book yet. Had your publisher reached out to them as of yet, or did they uh, sell out? Uh, I'm not sure. I think they might. Uh, they might have done, but they they might not be stocking it because they might go. Well, it's focusing on the Royal Navy's tribal class destroyers, not the Canadian ones. And I do admit that because, as I explained several times, I felt it rather rude if I wrote too much about the Australian and the Canadian. I had fleshed out the chapters and worked them out, but of course, I didn't get to visit Canada. Didn't get to visit Australia before COVID hit, and so a hey, I had to use my savings during COVID for the various other things, but also. I felt it'd be rude for me to go into the, uh, to cover those areas in too much detail when it'd be entirely off the work of others, not from my own reading of the primary sources. So that would uh, that would I would therefore understand them if they hadn't stopped it yet. Mission on the Moscow. Do VLS can uh, canisters represent a greater challenge with carrying nuclear warheads than the old swing arms? A missile sort of magazine in parts and then assembled before firing, like Talos. Uh, not really, but there are issues. There are issues with the style of canister. If you've seen the insides of the canister of the VLS system on the Moskva class, you'll get what I see. Uh, what I mean. That's what I mean. SSBNs equal capital ships. SSBNs are capital ships. Honestly, uh, again, definition. Are they deployed without with a minister's uh, do Does their deployment depend on a minister saying yes? If so, then they're a capital ship. So I just finished reading the Tender Hornblower and the press gang just went around. They really just go around and grab everyone by surprise. I thought you had a chance, you first had a chance to enlist by choice. Let's put it this way. There is the literary and Hollywood impression of the press gangs and there's the actual historiography. They're slightly different. Does the phrase capital ship not have the same derivation as capital assets when it comes to government funding as well? Pretty much. <laughs> Andrew Paul, referring to my earlier question about Japan retaining big keys. The assumption is that they get Canada's capital ships and cannot be replaced until 1931 at the earliest. Assume this is to be extra turret, uh, this to be extra tonnage. Yeah, they will be kept as they are, wandering around until 1931. They might have a slight emphasis efforts put into increasing their hull speed, uh, their, their engine speed, and that sort of thing. But honestly, probably they'll leave it so they can focus on other things and use that tonnage for a good ship. <laughs> Interesting. I've seen Minol as the spec, uh, spec for uh, the change in both, and the same way to charge shrug. You are right, and you are right, but this is where I start to sound okay, completely and utterly obsessively geeky. So the conversations I've had over the years with people who fired them all was that. Not necessarily with the first generation limbo, but by about mm, uh, ooh, the, the mid 1950s limbo. That's mid 1950s, yeah. 
the charge, the explosive power it seemed to have was far greater. And this was due to refinements in the chemical construct of the actual explosive compound. So it's the same compound, but it's been refined. It's been improved. Like most things. Uh, this, there are very few explosive compounds which have been around a long time which are not changed and evolved. Very few. And if they are left stable and left to where they are, there's usually a very, very sound economic reason for it. I said, if you won, why was IGN Taco not repaired by the British and taken some war trophy? And uh, they didn't need it. They had their own ships. <laughs> Sir Max, so there is potential for a second edition of TBD. Yeah, there's potential. Cool, Stefan. C.A. McDavid, hello. I kicked up a discussion on Discord with discussion, so I thought I'd ask you as well. What shape do you think a future Ukrainian Navy might take? Ooh. Well, they've got to focus on their army, but I would say SSKs would be a fairly sensible addition. Or some kind of conventional sub would be a fairly sensible addition. And some fast attack vessels. They don't. They, there's no point in having more, having large, more powerful ships, or trying to head for a carrier battle group or anything like that, because they honestly don't have the money to invest in their navy and their army at the same time. But they need to invest in the sea denials of assets, which will mean that their army can concentrate on fighting land battle. And rather having most of their southern forces tied down, protecting Odessa and the coast. Yeah, you know, the more they can push the Russian navy back from Odessa or from the coast, the more troops they can free up to fight around the various parts in the south. So yeah, that's what they're going to need to focus on. But it will depend on how much of the coastline they retain control of and how much stuff they have available. See, Richard, does anyone know about how the Southern yes, the Southerns is doing? Have they said you I think they're still working on her. <laughs> Do you think does the Moscow loss change US uh, Chinese forts on Taiwan or were losses of major ships or likely already factored in? Maybe hanging some uh, assumption about survivability while providing the fast walk? Let's put it this way. We can talk a lot about the Moskva, but here is the thing. Do we presume that the Russian systems and the Chinese systems are roughly equivalent and roughly equivalent with ours? Probably. However, those are the best quality systems. The Russian systems are severely impacted by the level of corruption and the level of problems they have with actually the implementation of their plans and their assets, which has led them to this scenario they're in. Now, and I say this as a big now. The Chinese also have problems of corruption, but do they have problems on the same scale? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Do the Chinese have the same problems on the same scale of corruption as the Russians? If they don't, then their ships will probably perform better. If their ships perform better, and they have more of them, and they have a larger area within which, within which they can operate, whereas Black Sea is fairly confined, they might think they're still fine. But also, it does depend on what kind of firepower Taiwan has. And if Taiwan has enough firepower, then they might well make the Chinese feel a significant amount of pain. And if I was the Taiwanese, I know what I'd be aiming for. 
their amphibious ships. Because cruisers can sit off my coast and blow things up from a distance all they like. But if I take out their marines and their troops coming to see the seas of the islands and get there, then they can't come and get me. So that's awesome. I hope so. I hope I did. For the Kenyans and the Australians. As I said, they were supposed to be, originally, would have been a far larger part of the book. But, um, originally there would be about three more chapters in that book. Um, Vision, can you switch warheads from interior within a modern VLS, or do you have to go in from the top of the deck? Top. Um, BBNJ like carried nukes in the 1980s for Tomahawks and armed box launchers like Moscow. Similar. You know, your thoughts on Admiral Harold Bowen's book, Ships, Machinery, and Mossbacks? Haven't read it yet. It's in my pile to read. But I have heard about it. And it's actually the third time this week it's been mentioned somewhere. I think it was mentioned on Discord earlier in the week, and that's when I looked up. Does anybody know about the US Southerns is doing uh, have they saved her? I haven't heard whether they saved her or not. I know they are still working on her though, and it will not be a quick process. Don't shame. My question is, are since there is a lack of battle cruisers, a lack of standard for naming battleships and battle cruisers, is there a naming theme instead? Like how the renowns are named like repulse being as in repulsing the enemy or drought and war spite is named for war spite in the spirit of war, etc. Um well basically there are traditional capital ship names for the Royal Navy, things which have traditionally been applied to first rates, second rates, and to extent third rates. And it's from those they tend to draw the battleship and carrier names and some of the other names. Uh, and those are names which are sort of the prestigious names. I would say with the R's, well, the Renown and Repulse are modified R-class battleships. So they kept with the R theme going on. And that's pretty much what the RN tried to do. I would argue that the big break is the Admiral theme, which comes in with... With you know, in the various points in the Royal Navy history, because the RN doesn't as a tradition like naming things after admirals. I thought it. Uh, I should have looked closer. I mean, on well, just came up with multiple for, uh, multiple formulations with more aluminium and other things to do as you described. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> let's put it this way. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is this explosive, but it's the, this is the same explosive. Um, what's the example given? Okay, I was from. A, I tend to use the example of uh, the dwarf axe in Terry Pratchett when it's being presented to, uh, to I think it's Vimes, and the king of the dwarfs goes, "I present you this axe. In a few years, few decades." It might need a new. It might need a new staff, a new handle, and that will be replaced with the uh, in the fashion of time. But it'll still be their great great grandfather's axe. Maybe a few generations beyond that, they'll need to get the head changed and refined and repaired. But it'll still be the great great grandfather's axe. There will need to be changes and upgraded, but it will still be always be the great great grandfather's axe, no matter how recently it's been fixed and repaired. My family has things like this. They're lovely. They are my many, many, many great grandfathers. But I'm fairly certain if you carbon dated the handle, if you carbonated the staff, if you carbonated, the, if you uh, checked the design pattern of the head, you would find they're not as old as they go back as a history in my family. 
In fact, to, if we go back, if we talk about it really in a nice way, I think it's probably the axe, which is the older one in the family, because originally, and it's the same name of the family, the axe, because uh, our surname was Hewitt Govan Clark, which is why, because we came from Govan in Scotland. Govan. And Hewitt was the family axe. We were warrior, uh, Clark means warrior who can write at certain points, while well, the way it's spelt with our name. But it's still our family axe. It's still the great-grand-grandfather's axe. And it's the same with these explosive formulation, uh, formulations. Uh, they can be modified and upgraded, but it's still that explosive. It's still made on that same principle. Andrew Paul, if Arin had towed Pola to Alexandria following Matapan, would she have been handed back to Italy in 1945, assuming she only taken part of that as alone, or would the scrapyard be more likely? Um, it depends. If they haven't, if she isn't in use, then she might be handed back to Italy, Italy in 1945. But if she's in use, then she'll be in service with the Royal Navy somewhere, probably in the Indian Ocean. That's where I think she'd have found herself in the Indian Ocean. Matthew, is it fair to say that the first generation of battle cruisers were going to be outdated anyway after 10 years? Is it fair? I think the way you're giving them 10 years is generous. I'd say eight, maybe six years. Right, I feel like post conflict, Ukraine and. Will, uh, Ukraine will talk to the Poles and will become the, uh, and, and will become the threat Russia previously fought. Um, I think the Ukrainians will become more effect, but I also think in the nicest way that the, the Russians have got to start watching the Poles. Because the Polish are watching everything that the Ukrainians are going through. And the Russians are going to have to start thinking, how do we deal with someone fighting like this? And you can say the Ukrainians in many ways have adopted the Finnish methodology of fighting and combat. And again, that should be worrying for the Russians. Because they know the, fin the Finns are up on one end of their border. The Ukrainians, if if everyone along the border starts operating with all that methodology, and I cannot see why Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia are not currently racing to adopt the same methodology, and I, from what I hear, they might well be, that could create a very big problem for the Russians in terms of, yeah, you can invade, but you ain't going anywhere. Last night they said yes, the Southerners were stable condition. Still listing significantly, but they pumped out more water than what is coming in. So I suppose coming on Monday. Hopefully that'll be good. <sighs> Did you decide to wear that shirt specifically for us? Hmm... Possibly when I was looking at my shirts this morning, I was thinking which looks the most appropriate for a brew ships today. And the mood I'm in for brew ships today. Basically, it's not so much I pick out the shirts for all of you, I pick out the shirts for what I'm feeling before I approach a video. So basically, you, basically the shirts are a good clue as to my, the mood I'm in. George Newman, Battleship New Jersey and Drax on Friday would be a long process, probably the last few months. Yes. In which case, I'd like, still like to visit if I'm allowed to. Um, I'll try and talk to them again, because so far, honestly, talking to them has been most difficult. Also because trying to get the Americans to accept that I am coming to America just for a day to see ships has been fun. But we'll leave that to one side. Um... But no, my my honest desire is to go and have a look at her, and I, I'm hoping they'll still allow me to go and have a look at her, because in many ways I want to see her more than I do the ship next to her. And I have seen a lot of stabilisation. So one of the things, if my dad was still alive, I can honestly say two things. One, he'd be coming with me to Canada. God help me trying to get stop him coming. Uh, he would be there. Um, it 
He would be. Um, not quite ninety years old, but he would be. He'd be. He'd be uh, let's see. This year he'd be eighty-eight years old, which is a little bit old. But it, considering his last international flight was the year before he died, and he was looking forward to another one, actually he had it booked up not long after, which was scheduled for not long after he died, actually, I think he'd have quite ugly gone, and he would have been coming over with me, and I'm fairly certain if they'd heard he was coming with me, and he was still alive, uh, they would be rolling out the red carpet, inviting him there to check it, out, check it over. Can't you say you're just a tourist at the border, doing sightseeing? I might end up having to try that one. Remember, that's clock. What would you think about fairly, a fairly spearfish of 1944 prototype? I think uh, I wish that Maltas had come into service because I think the fairy spearfish would have been a very useful asset. Now I'm just going to quickly move bags and things around because I can hear something running around outside, and I'm fairly certain in about mm, two or three seconds. You coming? There is a fluffy coming this way. You finished? Have you finished? Oh, you're taking over, are you? Okay. Up you go, Tony. If you're taking over, get up in the seat. Up you go, right. <sighs> Hello. I don't think they want the full demonstration of the fact that you're. Oh, you prefer me in there as your cushion. Okay. <sighs> All right. Hello. Oh. Right. <sighs> Okay. Speaking of Taiwan, come on, let's see for it. Speaking of Taiwan, they have 240 millimeter howitzers in place and coastal artillery. Imagine those would make it very not fun for any ship marines within 23,000 meters. Yeah, I don't think they would do fun. They would be fun at all for them to deal with. My turn. Is there any proof that the British should start a prototyping for 20 inch guns after World War One, and any proofing they were going to build in comparable? No proof they're going to build uncomparable. As for the 20-inch guns, well, there do appear to be some people working on those ideas, but I don't think they'd started proofing them yet. Interesting. If the US and Chinese suddenly decided to de-escalate it, how would they do a Washington Naval Treaty for the 2030s? Uh, you would have to get pretty much everyone involved in the treaty. Because they would they both so suspicious of each other, they would immediately immediately be scared that whilst they wouldn't be building, their allies would be. Allies and proxies. And there would be an interesting delineation of working out who the allies and proxies of China and America were. Remember, finish methodology. Yeah, the um, whole system of the, ter the sort of the territorial army that the Ukrainians have been using is operating according to the Finnish technology, uh, Finnish system, and the Finnish system of local units and their operational doctrine and command. It's very, very scary. 
um, for a force which is used to attacking a centralized organization. What damage of any uh, does uh, damage of any has Russia done to its military reputation due to the events in the last couple of months? And the incredible experts know its true strength. Yes, yes. I seem to remember having this conversation before it happened where I basically said, look, if it's six hours, the Russians win. If it's six days, the Russians win. If it's six weeks, the probability is their mass wins. Anything longer and the Russian logistics strains seriously starts to creak and fall apart. And that's always been the trouble. Is the debt of the Russians is the debt from logistics. Um, nice hearing. Would the fire, would the hoods five point five inch fifty cal guns be removed in a monoation had weight issues not forced their removal early? Probably, probably to be replaced by five point two fives, or maybe four point fives, depending on the uh, the idea of what they're going for. <laughs> George, you your dad would probably already be in Buffalo who's still alive. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. If my dad was still alive, I, he would have probably taken me with him, which would be nice. It would have been a fun thing. It would have been a bit of a boys' trip. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he would have already been called. Um, because he was called for all sorts of things. Uh, he was, yeah, the roving expert, and they like to call him when they needed him. Hello. Do you want to go back inside now, Heidi Bisky, and just say hello to everyone? Or do you want to stay here and take over my lap? Oh, you want another biscuit. You've got to not tell your mummy that I do this, okay? Go. But anyway, your York design sounds like I.J. Noida or a baby Dunkirk. Pretty much. I noticed the unit carrying Navy has a reserve slot and it's just got a shit shell. What do you think they want to build? Type 26 or 31 or something similar? You do need a new flagship. Probably a Type 31. Because that for them is what they need. Hang on. Sorry. Sorry, squirrel. You tried to survive on the ground. Be back in a second. Just going to save a. Squirrels safe now. Oh, I don't know. Sort of safe. As safe as they're ever gonna be. He decided to chase the squirrel himself, though. Hey, caramba. Uh... Anyway, what was the name of your dad if he's that famous? He was called Douglas Clark. And he wasn't famous, famous in terms of celebrity status. But as a naval architect, he was pretty darn good. Let's put it this way. Um, I was told the other day that actually I was wrong when I said his last design hasn't entered water yet because it's a Type 26 last design he worked on. No, nope, apparently there's a Shell Super Duper Tanker or Ultra Tanker, which they are still working on, which my dad also consulted on, apparently. And he designed a system for them based on the turrets of battleships, apparently, as well for them. For it for some reason, I have no idea what it's doing for them. I have no idea what they're using it for, but I was just told it by... I just was in a phone conversation with one of his friends, and he was going, Yeah, oh yeah, that bit your dad's designed, yeah. Of course, still there, yes, we're refining a bit, but yeah, still done by your dad. Again. I vision. I hope the politicians do rally around the ship. It does deserve it. Mm. 
Better feel when hood she sank, hood's 5.5 inch having replaced by a 4 inch. Yeah. All right, how frequently did the power of torpedo warheads improve from 1945 to 45? Not counting increase in torpedo diameter. Oh, they improved almost every other week, it seems to me. If you're looking at it, torpedoes are the things most consistently being worked on in that period in various oceans. There might be a airborne torpedoes improved, it might be the improvements in the submarine, in the submarine torpedoes and destroyer torpedoes. And everyone's working on them, and it's a constant sea of competition. The sea rangers, did the operator, uh, uh, did the iron operate the sea fury in the Korean War? And if so, how did it fare? It did well, and it actually the sea furies shot down some of the um, some jet fighters. So, yeah, they had fun. See, 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 McDevitt. Also, do you have a plan to build bookshelves for better bookshelves for your collection? It makes me so sad to see all the books. It's not finished yet. I've got more bookshelf space to go in underneath here and to finish stabilizing up the bookshelves up there. And I am going to get round to it. Um, this is, believe it or not, this level is supposed to be a model railway. This is supposed to be a model railway. There's also supposed to be more bookshelves over there. And I have got the things coming out so I can clear out all the stuff on the floor in here and I can do the proper floor stabilization because that's what it got stopped by. I need to stabilize the floor. I basically need to put a proper coating and protection over it because when the builders. That's what it's right. Parts of this, uh, the, the things were built by builders, and part of it was ended up having to be taken over by me after we kicked the builders off the job because they were doing a terrible. They were actually doing a terrible job. Drac ended up having to come help me stabilize the floor with pouring in tons of concrete, etc. All sorts of things, but that's meant that. We got in here, we've got been able to use it, and I made it usable. I fixed my sister's office up properly, but my office hasn't been... I didn't have the time to, before I had to move in here and start working from here, to actually get everything done. So I've got to build up the time again and some of the recordings so I can take about a week or so off, which will probably be after June, but probably before August. So probably some point in July, I will. Do, there'll be a week where the lives will be from a different locale, in the house, probably, and that'll be because this will be done. Uh, be being done, or I'll do it from my sister's office for a week. You'll see me off talking from my sister's office. <laughs> and then you'll be better when you get back in here. You'll go, "Oh, everything's been done," and hopefully, I'll have my iron brew bottle display up, which will also free up a whole bookshelf. And then the books will be more organized. And now I'll just get more books, so it'll become even less organized again. <sighs> Hi, Jack Ray. Don't worry, you're sent back to 1934. Get control of the fleet air on. What do you do? I'm sent back to 1934. Henderson is director of naval construct, is third sea lord. Uh, Goodall is now DNC. I have to deal with an idiot at Chatfield. But let's say I'm going back and I replace Chatfield as first sea lord somehow. And I've got control of the fleet air arm. First thing I'm doing is ordering the new engines. I'm ordering 2,000 horsepower engines and saying they're what I need. Um, I'm starting work on that gull wings. I'm making sure that gull wings fighter is being built. I've got five years to get into service. I will get it into service by hook or by crook. Um, what else am I going to do? Oh yeah, I'm going to start rapid building aircraft carriers. And I am. I'm going to basically go... Ooh, I've got enough time to prepare for the London Naval Treaty 2nd edition in 1936. And I'm going to change it, change the entire emphasis around and say I want more carriers. And I'll honestly turn around to Polish and say I need the more carriers to prep for maritime control. I'll say I need the aircraft for scouting, reconnaissance, and, and all those sort of commerce protection missions and that they are essential for it. And I'll, I'll, in, in, I'll make sure there's another category of carriers introduced, which are sort of cheap carriers. 
so I can produce escort carriers without affecting my fleet tonnage. And I'll do that by saying, well, I have to build a lot more fleet carriers then. Or you can allow me to introduce a cruiser escort carrier level, which is a vessel which is up to, I don't know, 15,000 tons, raise the strike carrier up to 30,000 tons, and say, right then, well, I'm allowed X number of these carriers, aren't I? And I'm allowed X number of these, so I'll try and make it so I'm allowed at least eight of each. Eight to nine of each, preferably. And then start and then build stuff and just keep building. So probably Ark Royal Sister would be ordered, but Ark Royal Sister, it would be an Ark Royal design adapted to, so with the same level of uh, size of hangar, etc., but with an armored flight deck. So an I would have the armor deck, which you could uh, which you could adapt it with, and I would just keep churning out ships like that, lots of them. You haven't missed the five books yet, Jeff. Oh, we're saving the squirrel from the poodle. Yeah, CA McDavid, I've heard the US Navy has offered the uh, sort of Ukraine a pair of all the OHPs. Good idea or not? What are they going to do with them? No, this is the serious question. It's like, <clears throat> even a Type 31, that's lovely. And it's nice to have a larger ship to wander around in and do some operations in. That's fine. But it's going to require a lot of crew. And in any war in the Black Sea, you are dealing with the Russians having an overwhelming amount of firepower. So first surface ships are not going to be much use. You're not going to be able to fight it. You're never going to have the same size fleet as the Russians. You're not going to match them toe to toe. And your OHP is just as old as the Russians' large units. So again, I be they need diesel submarines. If that and they and if anything be useful for the Ukraine to be SSKs, base amount of Odessa, they'll be useful. What secondary gun would the hood have if it got if the timing of the gun is the five point five inch guns never happened? Well, she'd either got six inch guns or she'd have got four inch guns, wouldn't she? Probably six inch. So anyway, if a man is saying he is saying doing something, he is doing it. Well, you don't have to remind me every six months. No, I I do hold my hands up. It has been absolutely. It's got down. It's been about a year, and it hasn't managed to move forward. But in that time, we've stabilized all the concrete and we've had to put in stabilizing agent on that. And it's just the time I keep allocating to doing the office keeps going on the whole building rather than fixing up my part of the building. And that's on me. I've got to allocate more time to it. And I've got a lot of stop letting it get taken up by other things. But I've also done a few things around the house, etc. And that's what happens. Malaga, at what stage are you going to build a library? Oh, that, that is the plan. If I earn enough money that I can start, I can actually put together and rebuild the savings I was putting together for buying a house, deposit on a house, that's what I'll be doing. I'll be converting a large chunk of the house into a library. Well, I only have myself to look after, so spaces for that. Listen, I have 2,000 horsepower engines, radials are liquid cooled. I will take whatever you can get as long as it's 2,000 horsepower. I don't care whether it's radial, liquid cooled, or I don't 
worry as long I just need at least two thousand horsepower. Right, right, Doctor Clark, Mister Raceback, Mister Raceback says you have a thick accent. Either she's wrong, or my English accent ancestry leads me to filter it out. Thoughts? Uh, well. You see, the thing is, I can, I do have quite a strong accent when I want to be, but I can go very, very posh as well. I can go really quite posh. So, um, it, it's a tough thing. And I can go very Cornish if I'm down in Cornwall. I, I can really start sounding Cornish in Cornwall. And I can sound Scottish in Scotland. So, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I, I, I do have a thick English English accent, I presume. Lots of people do hear me and they immediately go, ah, English. When I'm talking. Hmm. I was asking, if Ukraine regains Crimea and Sevastopol as a result of this war, they could easily go for bigger ships. If Sevastopol is still in Russian afterwards, then yeah, subs and small robbers. Why would they want the bigger ships, though? Where are they going to be projecting power to that requires the bigger ships? This is the question you had to ask. Okay, if you're a crane, where are you? why are you building those bigger ships? Because that's money you're not spending on your army and your air force. And let's be honest, what's Ukraine's primary threat? Russia. And their primary threat, therefore, is land invasion or air and air attack from Russia. Therefore, the naval firepower, why are they building the bigger ships? Britain and America need the bigger ships because they need to project power a long way away. In which case, you need to take that firepower with you. You need to take a ship. But if your firepower is needed right next to the over your border, then you your set, what you need is a lot of logistics, a lot of engineering, a lot of capability in your army, and a lot of capability in your air force. The Scolds will be quite good. All the Visbees. They need air defense. So you need to be the original version of the air, air, air defense. Which battlecruiser was it that sparked German battlecruisers? Uh, it was the Invincibles. The Squirrel did get away, but it was close. How nonsensical is it that some uh, that some alternate university against the odds where Canada operates USS Arizona? Well, if you get it, you're not going to complain about it, are you? Right then. At some point, I do actually have to uh, start talking about the books, and I'm, as I've caught up with the questions and managed to answer them all, I'm going to start to open up the books. So that's 84. 84 divided by 3 is 28. And that is probably going to be at least. Right in. So, those of you who are watching, I have just updated the timestamps and put it in. So it's now working. Woohoo! And I should also add, while I'm uh, while I'm talking to you all, that there is a link to the patron vote in the description down below for April, and that is live.
And currently 35 votes have been cast. Scapa Flow is in the lead. But Malta Under Siege is very close behind, as is Soviet Surface Raiders, Kriegsmarine using diesel power. Hmm. I'm surprised cruisers and cruiser actions of the Spanish-American War is not doing better. And I will say that that actually did kind of... Well, that was very, very cool, because the Glyn Stewart who did that, you all know, because I talk about his books quite often. He's the very, you know, he, he he's the one who writes the sort of the Peacekeepers of Soul series and the other series I've been talking about and sort of science fictions. And he, he, as you know, he helped out with the Andro uh, the Glorious Heritage Cruise. I'm looking at that and giving me a sci-fi author's perspective, and he's a really good sci-fi author. And yeah, he 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 wrote a suggestion, and I was sort of going. That's cool. <laughs> also, I would like to announce that Twitter apparently seems to be broken by a number of people laughing at someone who has posted a picture of the Challenger 2 with name a sexier tank and they'll wait. Hello, Glenn. Sure. There was a was a point where battleships fit the RCMS message. I took a lot of time. Depends on what you're doing with the ships. The only point at which the RCN actually needs battle or consider consider battleships is World War One. But if they did want it in World War Two, it would probably be as their flagship, and then it would be a purpose of. It, I could see it having a mission if there had been a lot more German battleships. Basically, it's one of those scenarios. The only time you get, the only time you got the Canadians want a battleship is if there's a lot more battleships in the service. So basically, it's like today: the Canadians don't want an aircraft carrier and don't really need an aircraft carrier in service. Although an LHD would be incredibly useful. And please note that. And when I say an LHD, I mean with something with ski ramp, so it can take F-35Bs. But if suddenly you've got more Russian aircraft carriers than one involved wandering around, more Chinese aircraft carriers wandering around, and suddenly the dem large democratic nations and nations which have the infrastructure and maritime capability to actually support more complicated ships like, air like aircraft carriers are going, hang on, can we support enough to maintain all the missions to match up with these? Now, at which point Canada might well want to have one or two. It's kind of like Australia. LHDs work well. Aircraft carriers, it's if you need them. And it need, if you need them, it's very much on your exposure to the global system. Britain is incredibly exposed to the global system, as is Japan. And there's no surprise that both of those island nations have gone actually having aircraft carriers or aircraft carrier like ships. Makes sense. And yes, perfectly agreed, Glyn. And that you, you said exactly what I said uh, at the same time. When the LHDs that were being built for the Russians were being sold off by the French and were bought by the Egyptians, they should have been bought by the Canadians because those two LHDs would have been incredibly useful for the Canadians right about now because that would have basically given them a, a massive boost in their Arctic presence. A massive boost in their capabilities. My turn. Guess the Titanic 1 Patrol is releasing tomorrow. Um, probably Wednesday. Probably Wednesday, the Titanic Long Patrol is. This is me being honest. And seeing what's happened. There is, what would the space with an armoured deck arc roll come in at? Probably 25 to 26,000 tons. So they need to get the limit up to 27,000. Uh, nice hearing. I recently bought DK Brown's Nelson and Vanguard on tablet. DK Brown's rebuilding the Royal Navy warship design design for five. Worth considering buying? I have both, yes. They are worth considering buying. Remember, last time we used a battleship as a ship, well, it was British and we used it against the Americans. Yes, that was 
Various wars, the Canadians tend to beat up the Americans quite nastily sometimes. Can I show you the list of choices? Uh, I will do, but I'm first going to do the books, because otherwise I'm going to distract you from the books again. Yeah, France did offer, but the procurement process is slow and broken down. Why did Titanic was doomed? Now, I mentioned this in a Titanic Live, and I'll be mentioning it again in Long Patrol, so I'm not going to get into this too much. But um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm talk going to uh, talk about the chapters. First circumstance, a delayed maiden voyage. Second circumstance, the near miss that almost ended the deadly maiden voyage. Third circumstance, telegrams that could have changed history. Fourth circumstance, signing off for bed. Fifth circumstance, an accomplice moon, a dead calm sea and a missing key. Sixth circumstance, the deadly battle of vanity versus design. Seventh circumstance, a combination of more vanity and outdated regulations. Eighth circumstance, flawed construction materials. Ninth circumstance, speeding towards disaster. Tenth circumstance, a slow turning ship and an only seconds to the side. Eleventh circumstance, an un unsinkable myth. Twelfth circumstance, the coal strike that increased the death toll. Thirteenth circumstance, deadly secrets. The fourteenth circumstance, questions of confusion, panic, and mistake of the bridge, of sex and bridge. And final circumstance, bits of good fortune. And there are various what ifs and timelines. Now, 123 is the page of what ifs. And this was an interesting one which I looked at. There are many circumstances to work together to seal the fate of over 1,500 people who perished when the Titanic slipped below the uh, frigid North Atlantic in the early hours of the 15th April 1912. Consider what might have happened if any of these had been different. What if Olympic had not collided with the Hawk and delayed Titanic's maiden voyage? What if the Mesabas, the warning about the ice at 7.50pm, had carried the prefix MSG so that it would have been required to, uh, to go to Titanic's skip captain instead of being set aside in her wireless room? What if Titanic's radio had not been broken down and Phillips had not been so busy with a backlog of messages allowing him to take Evans' final ice warning from the Californian? What if Officer Groves had known the wit to wind up the, the, the dictator on the Californian's radar set so he could hear Titanic's distress call? What if Californian's captain or crew had responded to Titanic's distress rockets? What if Californian's radio operator had been awakened to find out what was going on? What if Titanic had held an emergency lifeboat drill so passengers and crew knew what to do to which lifeboats they had been assigned? What if Titanic's crew had been told lifeboats were reinforced and could be fully loaded before launch without fear of buckling? What if Titanic's lookouts had access to binoculars? What if the stronger seal originally for Titanic's hull had been used? What if Titanic's engines had not been reversed when the iceberg was, iceberg was spotted, perhaps allowing the ship to turn quicker and avoid the fatal collision? What if there had been moonlight so the lookouts could more easily spot the iceberg? What if the ocean had not been a dead calm and waves had been splashing against the iceberg, making it easier to see? What if Titanic's original design plan had been followed, leaving 48 lifeboats in place? What if the bulkheads had been built as originally specified and made watertight all the way to the top of each compartment? What if the White Star Line had done more to dispel the fallacy that the Titanic was unsinkable? It's an interesting book. It's a recurring problem in all democracies, Glyn. It's one of the interesting things. Uh, governments will... Uh, basically, the population tends to want the military to be able to do the things they want to do. But if you ask them what, how are you going to pay for it, they either presume that you're spending too much on the fence because people often forget that you're paying a premium for being able to operate in the most hostile environment imaginable to mankind. It's kind of like going, well, you know, I don't, I, I can take a regular car to the moon, can't I? Why do I need to take a special space car to operate on the moon? Well, you do. It's going to be different. It's the same with warships and other equipment and tanks, etc. They tend to add on the price, and especially when you're not building enough of the stuff, it tends to push the price up even more. But so it's always a case of where's the money going to come from? And when they don't have to spend it, they don't want to spend it because that's money they could be spending on things which is going to be popular and win them elections. Because democracies are about elections. Not a bad thing, but it's a factor.
Yeah, Villa, Canada, Canada either needs more out of many agencies or none. An Arctic incursion can either be dealt with by local Canadian Rangers and RCMP or by a brigade group, and Canada cannot afford lift for the latter. Well, to be fair, a couple of LHD, well, two or three LHDs are probably enough to make give them the forward presence they need. So anyway, isn't renaming Warship a bad idea at least a tragedy? Um, you need to do it properly. Yes, there are a lot of fans of Glynn's books here. Hmm. In the new Halo show, you take a regular pickup truck or SUV to the moon, and all the other planetary bodies of the 25th century. That's slightly worrying. Right. Well, this one's a good one. Um, Soldier, Rebel, Traitor. John Lord Wellink and the Wars of the Roses by Alexander uh, Brondabet. Now, honestly, I am biased because, of course, it's a fellow Alexander, and as we all know, Alexander's or Clark's tends to be a fairly good name to guarantee um, quality. But actually, this one is very, very good. An illuminating perspective into Warwick's many grievances with Edward is found within the brief chronicle Annals Rerum and Clancarum, written by an anonymous partisan of the Neville family. He is commonly known as the pseudo. An, uh, pseudo Worcester, Worcester, after the work was mistakenly attributed to the chronicle, chronicler William Worcester. The chronicler explains the many causes for Warwick's secret displeasure, Secretum Displesium, with Edward after 1466. It largely concer concerns the marriage and wardship market, which were used to build up the power of the Wendvilles and other royal favourites to Neville's de detriment. Elizabeth's family, consisting of 12 siblings and two sons from her previous marriage, required adequate provisions to reflect their newfound status. Limited in what land he could bestow, Edward instead leveraged his authority over the marriages of heirs and widows of his tenants-in-chief. To smooth the way, he provided his magnates with financial inducements to marry their heirs to the Windvilles. No less than an earl was considered sufficient for his sister-in-law, uh, sister as Catherine, Margaret, Anne, Eleanor, and Mary Woodville were respectively wed to the, uh, to the heir of the Duke of Buckingham and the heirs of the earldoms of Arundel, Essex, Kent, and Membrook. These marriages had implications on Warwick. They deprived him of several potential bridegrooms of sufficient wealth and status for his own daughters. The arrangement for the Queen's male kin proved even more problematic. Warwick's wealthy aunt, Catherine, Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, married Elizabeth's brother, Sir John Whitville. It was a scandalous arrangement that the Earl could only interpret as an utterly disparaging to his family. In 1465, Sir John was then aged about 19, while his bride, jokingly described as a slip of a girl, was in fact a sexagenarian. Pseudo Worcester understandably judged it as a diabolical marriage. Exacerbating the matter was Edward's decision to break off a potential match between his niece, the heiress of the Duke of Exeter, and Warwick's nephew, to whom she had been betrothed. The king arranged a wedding between Thomas Grey, knight, the queen's son, and Lady Anne, heiress of the Duke of Exeter, the king's niece. To the great and secret displeasure of Warwick, for a marriage was previously bespoken between the said Lady Anne and the sons, uh, son of the Earl of Northumberland the Earl of Warwick's brother, and the Queen paid the said Duchess 4,000 marks for the aforesaid marriage. With few potential husbands to choose from, Warwick set his sights on the most eligible bachelor in the country, who was then his wardship, the Duke of Clarence. Warwick hoped to marry the 15-year-old Duke to his eldest daughter, Isabel. Even with the birth of Edward's daughter, Elizabeth of York, on 11 February 1466, Clarence remained the King's male heir, offering Warwick the possibility that his descendants might one day rule the country. To the Earl, such a match was entirely suitable given his own wealth and status. It also offered him the opportunity to strengthen the tie of kinship with the royal family, keeping Neville's firmly in power. Yet this did not occur. It rejected the proposal for reasons that are not entirely clear, although diplomatic considerations were surely factors. The decision not only agreed Warwick, but it also stirred resentment in Clarence. Both placed their disappointment and anger on the Queen and her family, yet remained under the They continued to negotiate in secret and went so far as to include an Edward's representative at the Papal Curia to help them secure a papal dispensation since the potential bride and groom were related in multiple degrees.
it's a really, really interesting book. And, well, how do I put this? Wenlock is the person it's all built around, and it's worthwhile studying him. He's one of the less known representatives in this period, but it's worthwhile knowing him because he's kind of involved in everything. Um, I have friends who are like this. They're never going to be the headline act. They're never going to be the one who everyone knows in history. But once you start looking down, it's kind of like the third sea lord, who I often talk about, Henderson, in that, yeah, he's not much well-known in history. You're going to hear about Cunninghams. You're going to hear about... But without Henderson, there wouldn't have been the fleet that there was in World War II. And it's kind of like this with Wenlock. He is the one who actually gets everything done and lined up. But he knows that if he keeps his head just below the parapet, in certain extent, it's far safer. It's really annoying that no one seems to want to explain the pro that problem, while certain opponents get to make all sorts of wild claims about being challenged. Yeah, it is fun. Sage, yes, Glyn writes very, very good books. He does. All right, so, uh, Dr. Locke, there's a series of books titled Stuff that doesn't, uh, doesn't just happen. The idea being most disasters are made possible by a very specific sequence of events. Disrupt one of them and disasters are avoided. That's true. Good luck, Glenn. Yeah, uh, yes, I think you'll enjoy the book list later. I think the one you'll enjoy most is this one. Naval Battles of the Second World War by Leo Marriott. It's a very, very cool book. Um... <laughs> yeah, Peter, I recommend the book The Guns of John Moses Browning, especially the part of the fact that the FN-1900 Browning pocket missiles in Europe. Mm, that's a good, nice book. Sounds interesting. Vision. Shows you how bad inflation and supply chain issues have become. Centuries from the now, early 21st century motor vehicles will still be in wide use across a known galaxy. The UNC Spartan Rover is cool. Rick Vassar. Canadian Rangers and RCMP? Rangers have bolt-action rifles. They are, uh, they are eyes and ears. Mounties are a police force. We need a credible military presence in the Arctic. And I have trained with Rangers. Hmm, Rick Vassar. I have, I'm, I'm looking forward to actually... I'm hoping, I'm hoping while I'm out there, I'll, leave, I'll be able to ba bump into my Mountie cousins uh, while I'm in Canada. And actually, that's causing some sort of interesting things, working out the exact timelines. Because what's happening is Drac's going to be heading home early, and I'm going to have a couple of days which are literally assigned to me meeting up with Canadian family relatives while I'm out there. And it's going to be fun. But I probably should give people a headline order of avoid this area. There will be lots of clerks and relatives of descending on parts of Ca coming across from parts of America, etc., to Canada. Referees like sleep's overrated. Enjoy Glenn's books. Sim Richards, if the Isles are built with small tube boilers, what do their careers look like? They are a lot faster. If they're built with small tube boilers, um, the odds are they're a lot faster. The odds are the... Let's put it this way. The R's will only be built with small tube boilers if the Queen's have been built with small tube boilers. So the Queen's, uh, Queen and the Liver class have been built with small tube boilers and the R's are. Then the odds are you have both classes roughly 28 knots. In which case you have fast battleships already in service. Which is going to change the, uh, going to change the circumstance of World War II. But it's going to also immediately mean that these ships are a lot wor more worthwhile investing in because they are that much faster and that much more capable and that much more scary. They're not going to be... Uh, when we're talking about Operation C, one of the things that holds Somerville back, in a way, is only having one battleship that is a fast ship. If he has a lot more fast ships, then he's a lot more capable. You'd also see a lot less pressure. A lot uh, the pressure on 
renown, repulse, and to an extent, extent Hood and Prince of Wales, etc., would be far less if you've got the R class are faster from the get go. And the Queen Elizabeth are faster from the get go. That would be an interesting thing. So it would change a lot of the war scenario. John Farrell, the German light cruisers, were there plans for them to have quad turrets? Nope, not as far as I know. They were looking at four twin turrets next. That's it. Uh, battle cruiser hood really is overhyped, people say. I, I, I'd thought if you have someone say the battle cruiser is outdated, then ask back if it's outdated, then why is the Royal Navy using three model two? Mm, basically, it's easy to say the battle cruiser is outdated and overhyped because. How do I put this? The battle cruisers of the Royal Navy have their biggest impact pre-war in the planning and the do and the assessments of the their potential enemies. That's the thing. The battle cruisers have the impact there. Hugh Hunt, was the Fred T. Jane's weekly newspaper column under the wet ends in ever published in book form? I think it was, but I'm not sure whether the whole thing was published or whether it was just parts of it. George Eames, Alan Emerson is currently listing Soldier Rebel Traitor as a pre order. It's worthwhile getting. I've got them. These have been sent to me directly by the publishers. What do you think of uh, hey, Dr. Clark, what do you think of the Battletech universe? I haven't yet delved into it too much. It's there on my list of things to delve into, but I haven't managed to. So, Navals of the uh, Naval Battles of the Second World War, The Atlantic and Mediterranean by Leo Marriott. Now, my first thing when I saw this was <sighs> Good golly, Miss Molly, it's short. But It's got a list of warships, and I quickly realized what this book is, is a wonderful introduction and overview to the battles involved. And it is really wonderful. Every battle, every one of the key battles, and these are the, some of the famous ones, are summed up in five or six pages. And it is literally 150 pages long. And it does the Battle of River Plate, the first Battle of Narvik, second Battle of Narvik. It doesn't actually. I would argue it uses the second and third Battles of Narvik, but that is me because I am a Norwegian, uh, because I like to count the Norwegian fighting the Germans as the first Battle of Narvik. But that is that is a a representation of history rather than a inaccuracy of history. The loss of HMS Glorious, the pursuit of the Bismarck, Operation Cerberus. Um, I've always known as a channel dash. P Convoy PQ-17, Battle of the Barents Sea, Battle of North Cape, Battle of Atlantic. Metrani Sea, Merza Kabir, sinking the of the Bartolomeo Culliani. Uh, Taranto, Battle of Matapan, destruction of the Duisburg Convoy. Uh, Battle of Cert, Operation Harpoon and Vigorous, Operation Pedestal and Casablanca. Again, I would like to see Kate Bond in here, but there again, Kate Bond is really not that famous. But I like Kate Bond. It's a good battle. And it's really well written. It's really fun. And it's got these. Plans, pictures. Plans and pictures. So every single description has a decent sized amount of text, plans and pictures. It is what I would call an introduction to the battles of the second of the naval battles of the Second World War in the Atlantic and Mediterranean. And I would actually call it an introduction to the major naval battles of the Second World War. And it is very much worthwhile getting. If you want to click flick through those battles because you aren't particularly interested in the Second World War and you want to know them after so you can have a bit of discussion, understand discussions about them, it's a good book. If you are looking for an overview text which is going to allow you to put them all in context and in the ribbon or the flow, this is a good book. If you just want something fun to read to get your juices going and make you think about these things, this is a good book. And I do like it a lot. 
Leo Marriott, Naval Battles of the Second World War. Team Richard, what's the difference in cost between the small tube boilers and the ones I used? Costs not that massive, but the thing is, the Royal Navy was heavily persuaded by the shipyards that small tube boilers were not yet reliable enough. Mainly because they were, if you to get small tube boilers, the yards would have had to buy them from one one producer in the UK who was producing them in sufficient quantity and size for battleships. Whereas the rest hadn't yet got them worked out. And that would have meant they couldn't have built them themselves. Next we have... One of my favourite people of all time. Edward I Regent. Edward of Cor Edmund of Cornwall. Now, let's be honest, anyone who's called Edmund, who comes from Cornwall, is going to be the sort of person who's going to beat you up if you, ca you cause him trouble, or be your greatest friend if you don't. And pretty much that describes Edmund to a T. Now, here's the interesting. The breakdown of the marriage is an interesting chapter to read about, because we don't think about divorce, etc., at this point in time, Edward refers, but this is what happens. The marriage deteriorated after 1286. Perhaps the failed pregnancy triggered a downward spiral. Whether it was the absence of children and or other issues which caused rift cannot be ascertained. Rosemary Hill noted that Margaret accused Edmund of neglect and of such cruel treatments that she feared for her life, but Hill suggested that the fault was probably not entirely on his, Edmund's side. For well, the quick tempers of the Declares were notorious, and Margaret's brothers, Gilbert and Bogo, were renowned for their testiness. And by 1289, Edmund wanted a separation and took the initiative, but John Peckham, Archbishop of Canterbury, was determined to reconcile the couple. Margaret lost her mother in March out of that year. Writing from Fulham on the 1st of December 1289, the Archbishop stated that I have spoken to my lady of the Countess, according to the bull from the Pope, as to the two points which it contains. The Pope ordered Peckham to interfere to make peace between you and her, it has failed. He was to secure a vow of chastity from Margaret, who replied that she desires peace between you and herself more than anything else in the world, and says that she does not believe that the trouble caused to her comes from your, Edmund's, heart. On the vow of chastity, she replied that she is not advised to vow chastity, because this would be, if she did it, as much to corroborate the blame and falsehoods which are put upon her. She pressed Peckham to seek a peace between her and Edmund, in a bid for the Archbishop of Sympathy, she persuaded him that the lady's state is weak and dangerous. Peck advised her not to leave the country until he had spoken to Edmund, whom he had asked to come to see him. He, stre he stressed that he was willing to travel to see Edmund himself, but was prevented because of a visitation to remedy defaults in the Diocese of London. Peck amended the letter, I wish to abate this slander if God gives me power, nor can I neglect it without great sin. The letter indicates the determination of the all three parties, Margaret to win back Edmund, his resistance, and the Archbishop siding with the Countess. If a wife agreed to her separation and to remain chaste, the former husband might be free to remarry. Was Edmund trying to induce Margaret to take a vow of chastity so that he would be free to remarry? There is no evidence of this as a motive, and the fact that he did not remarry seems conclusive. By May 19, 1290, Peckham's plan of using the bishops of Hereford and Rochester to persuade Edmund to receive back his noble wife, whom he had left, had failed. On the 8th of May, Peckham returned to three other bishops, Winchester, Worcester, and St. David's, to go to the Earl and to induce him to take back his wife within 15 days. By October, the bishops of Winchester and Lincoln had been appointed papal legates to examine the matter. The Archbishop had expected the bishops to share his enthusiasm. He was misguided. Perhaps he did not appreciate that Edmund knew these bishops very well. He had often been at court with them, and as shown by the Terence together, as charter witnesses. Von Toys of Winchester had written a very friendly letter to Edmund when he received the bishopric. Bishops Oliver Sutton of Lincoln and Geoffrey Girard of Worcester appealed to the Pope in August 1290 against Peckham's 
mandate to the bishops in whose diocese Edmund held lands to return to his wife and treat her properly and to excommunicate him if he did not. The bishops argued that excommunication was an encroachment on archiepiscopal jurisdiction since the person concerned was only indirectly in the archbishop's subject. Edmund himself appealed to Rome in August 1291. Although judges were appointed to hear the appeals, Peckham treated Edmund as if he was already excommunicated. And despite the appeals on 12 August 1291, he wrote to the Minister General's Grey Friars, urging him to, do nothing to have nothing to do with Edmund. Meanwhile, Burgo de Clare and Edmund came close to blows. Burgo had attempted a reconciliation, and when this failed, he served a writ on Edmund from Peckham, threatening him with excommunication and requiring him to attend the Archbishop's court. This action occurred during the Easter Parliament 1291, when else Edmund was crossing the middle of the Great Hall at Westminster, making his way to a meeting of the King's Council. Edmund brought a complaint against Burgo and the Prior of Holy Trinity London for citing him to appear at a court Christian while he was at session of Parliament, which was illegal at the time. He claimed that anyone had the right to have the benefit of the peace of the king and to come lawfully and peacefully to pursue his business without receiving any citation or summons there. He alleged that the prior had acted at the instigation of Burgo. This was a manifest contempt of royal privilege and the liberties of the abbot of Westminster. The damage to the king was assessed at £10,000 and to the abbot at £1,000. The action also impinged upon the officers of the steward, uh, Peter de Chumfitter, and the marshal, William de Francock. The damage to Edmund himself was said to be worth £5,000. The prior and Burgo appeared, and Burgo admitted the offence, but said that he had completely unaware that the aforesaid place was exempt, and that he did not mean any contempt or prejudice to the officials. He put himself at the king's mercy. The king was very angry at this breach of parliamentary privilege, and Burgo and the prior were sent to the Tower of London. The prior and his covenant were pardoned for dishonour. They did not, uh, they did to the body of the late queen when lately passing through the priory. To secure his release, Burgo agreed to pay 2,000 marks to the king and 1,000 Edmund. However, at the request of the bishops Durham and Eglite, Edmund agreed to accept £100. The archbishop was fined £10,000. Henry Summerson saw Burgo's intervention as an act of fraternal loyalty, but it could have been another example of the Clare temper. And believe it or not, there is a divorce. It is a really interesting book. It's a really interesting person who you don't hear enough about in history lessons. If you go to school, you are not going, and you talk about Edward the Confessor, and you talk about all the things that goes on this period, you will not hear about Edmund of Cornwall. He very rarely comes up in the regular school history books, because he is one of those characters who's just a name in history. But rather like the person I was talking about earlier, John Lord Wenlock. If you don't have Edmund of Cornwall, you do not have a lot of history happen, because he's the one who gets things done. There are very few English lords, especially someone from Cornwall, who can scare a pope. He can. Hi, Dan Truman. Nice Somehow I doubt the Audacious could operate a spearfish given its la large wing cane. It would have been interesting. The Maltas were definitely a better position for it. Remember, I would read Naval Battles of the Second World War just to see how cute condensed engagements have been individually converted in whole books down to 10 pages less. It is an interesting feat. The fact of being able to do that is a skill. The whole RA in World War One uses small tube boilers. What changes from destroyer to pre-dreadnought to dreadnought? Uh, everything's a lot faster. Everything is a lot faster. Sam and David, I currently I suddenly had the mental image of Dr. Clark reviewing the Battle of the Haunted City in my own book and was suddenly frightened. Don't worry. You never know. <coughs> Thank you, Bijan. Uh, GeoGo, when Battletech first came out in the mid-80s, it was called Battle Droids, and the company got in trouble for using unlicensed designs from Macross and other anime. Ooh, that's a shame. And there, are, there are sometimes I understand them getting into trouble, but there are sometimes I just go in a nice way, call up and go, let's share. So this is the book which, unfortunately, it came in the packaging from Pen and Sword. It got a bit damaged. So that wasn't me. I literally got out of the package and it was like that. But 
It's Ship Models from the Age of Sail by Kerry Jang. And building and enhancing commercial kits. It so if you are a really focused modeler, at this point, this is the, probably the purpose on which someone should probably tag Kate Jameson. Because honestly, if anyone should be reviewing this book, it should probably be her, considering all the modeling she does. This is the book for you because it gets you through everything, and it it just. It is really, really cool. It's got other books in here to point out. It's got a review of how to do solid hull modeling. And for those of you who don't know solid hull modeling, that is some really cool stuff you can do with solid hull modeling. You can really do some cool things with it. Um, especially if you're building wooden ships. And it's just, it is an absolutely amazing step by step guide to how you enhance models, how you build models. What you can do with kits. It's just. It's great fun to read. It's really well written. It's really well put together. It includes a review of glues. And the whole way through. It's building a ship for you. And you get to see it being put together. And how it comes together. And how they build a cannon. Which was really quite cool. I had a lot of fun with the cannon construction. The planking. It's just good. It is really good. The deck fittings. Where you can get... The, it's quite interesting because it goes... This is how you can build it, but this is also where you can get it. And look at some of this design work. And... This person is, A, an incredibly good modeler, but they're also very good at writing about modeling, and that's something really enjoyable to read. I presume she's, bu uh, she's busy doing other things, but yes, this is the sort of thing which Kate Jameson is really, really good for. And this is the sort of book which I can imagine, uh, which honestly, if I text, if I offered and dropped off with Kate, I'd probably end up seeing pictures upon pictures of ships being built for the next month or so, a, month, a couple of months, in her, um, her Twitter feed as she just worked her way through them all. But, yeah. Very, very good book. Very fun to read. And if I give you an example... Um... Yeah, deck fitting. Let's do deck fittings. A ship's deck is covered with fittings and they are fun to make. There are a few tricks to making them easier to assemble, as well as making them look a little more realistic. One of the most prominent features are the gratings. Reference works show how the gratings coming, uh, combings were built with lap joints, but if you are painting them, then simple butt joints will do. The most important feature is the gratings themselves. Kits and scratch, build, uh, scratch builders alike use a form of the comb method. When the gratings are assembled, they look out. Uh, they are assembled. What to look out for is whether or not the resulting square holes are to scale. Often the holes are too large, and a 172s scale Matalot's foot would fall into the holes, breaking his ankles. Ouch. The ship's wheel is made up of etched brass components that give a delightful, delicate look. It is painted to look like varnished wood by priming the item in a light tan or white paint overall. A mix of burnt umber and burnt sienna artist oils are mixed together with uh, a little liquid medium, liquid medium, and uh, the paint streaks over the part. The paint is semi-transparent and is brushed out to give, the wood, uh, give a wood grain effect. The wheel has a decorative brass insert mounted in its circumference, and this is easily represented by scraping the paint of the uh, raised area, allowing the brass to show through. Nothing looks more like a brass than brass. Tiller ropes can be added around the barrel that feed into, uh, into holes drilled through the wood deck. The binnacle is made up of laser-cut walnut, which is easy to assemble. It is detailed by adding glazing from the micro-crystal clear, uh, lashings to the deck and a small disc of plastic painted brass can be placed inside as the compass. A small air vent can also be added to, from plastic rod and painted brass. And it has illustrations and everything to describe it. It's just 
It is wonderful. I could see myself building, building with this if I built these sort of ships. I tend to build later ships when I'm building them. Uh, I, I tend to buy wooden models of sailing ships for some reason, but I build later ships. Also, I get given some really cool wooden models of ships. Um. Mm -hmm. Right then. So, now that seems to be worth through the books. And that will be thirty six forty four. So, questions twelve fifty scale is more manageable. Yes, in the struggling, it is. It is more manageable. Hmm. Battle tech. Hmm. Right, so if we're going to talk battle tech, starters, I'm going to try and find a picture of it. <laughs> That's a decent picture. Let's see, can I find a decent picture? Images, battle tech ship, come on. Hmm. Not sure if that's a real one. Is it on SARTA DeviantNet? Battletech fandom probably as the, as the, the those pictures are probably accurate and more slightly more accurate because anything which is fandom is usually fairly accurate. Oh, I can work with that one. That looks fairly cool. And right then, so I'm going to add it, and you should see it shortly. Ba 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 bum bum bum. Image file <coughs> and desktop. That's how this works. Da -da -da -da. That didn't work. Oh, that's annoying. Copy image, let's do it this way. Blah, blah, blah.
Let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Can I get this to work for me? Can I get this to work for me? I'm sure I can get it to work for me. I'm sure I can. He says. Row ship 76. Type that in. Six and that's the seventeenth of April and bum. Get rid of you and bum. That's an assault frigate. Onslaught assault frigate. And let's go to this one. And 12 choices. Put that together. Maybe. Sorry to be doing this live on air, but it's as I was asked. I've put it to get. I've found it, put it, getting it to work, and now putting it up. I don't know. And let's see if I can do that. And boom. Done. Sometimes, sometimes, it, it, at the speed at which I produce these things does actually worry me. But sometimes, it's really quite helpful. And add up. Brewship 76, Brewship 76. Bum -bum. Okay. Onslaught, Assault Frigate. They do look quite good, don't they? I have to admit, the Battletech stuff, I haven't played it. This is my, this is my main thing, so I haven't really played it. But I have looked at some of the ships over the years, and I have looked at them so they do look kind of cool. It'd be interesting and probably more useful to actually got uh, to actually to play it and to actually look in more detail. This, this the trouble is it, it, there are some there are some options which come uh, come through in terms of construction sometimes of these things, and you go, hmm, this could be interesting. There's also always the fact that you know anything sci-fi related, the rule of cool does always have a factor, and it's, it, these do look cool. Why are some Mercy class Amity trawlers completed as hydrophone trawlers? Because you needed to have oceanography going on. They still need to be ma mapping things. McKenna class battleship on DeviantArt. Ooh, I'll have to look that up. How could the Royal Navy have won the Battle of Chesapeake, and how would the defeat is still British 13 colonies affect the Royal Navy and the Empire in general? Um, winning the Battle of Chesapeake basically requires you have a far more aggressive commander, and the fleet is in better condition. 
and you could have done it, but it's a tough one. But if you do win, then that stops probably the French supplies flowing into the US and also means that at certain points the British still maintain the strategic maneuverability of the sea in a far more dominant level, at which point you still might not win ultimately, but you might not lose places like New York, etc. You might end up with there being a British entrepont on a North American uh, continent, which could be a constant fawn in the side for the Americans, but they could also decide that, frankly, there is, they don't want to go to war with the Brits for it. They are happy with their freedom. And the British could decide that having New York is very useful. Interesting enough, you could therefore end up with a scenario like today where New York is a North American version of Gibraltar. Or it could be a North American version of Singapore. All depends on how much territory and area it has. Night, Jonathan Barrow. Geo Guy 001, do the Type 45s have enough magazine capacity to, for their SAMs to protect the Queen Elizabeth against saturation attack by new you know who? Depends how many missiles are brought. That's interesting. They have enough, but let's, be, let, let's say you've got 48 on each one, so you have 96 combined. Now, let's say you're, it's post the Sea Scepter upgrade, so they've now got 24 Sea Scepters, so they have 24, uh, 20, 72 missiles. That's 36 missiles each. They can be taken out. That's fine. but uh, And it's going to be the layers of air defense. Again, I keep trying to explain this to people. It's not, you aren't fighting a task force. You're not fighting one ship. You're fighting the task group. So let's say they have two Type 45s. And they don't have an army Burke along. So maybe they have three Type 45s. Okay, so you have... All those missiles. And you have the missiles from the Type 26s. And you have the F-35s. What sort of level of strike you're looking at? Well, again, you're expect uh, I'm I'm using the ratio of two surface air missiles being needed for every one missile at enemy missile taken down. So that gives you a saturation of tank of You've then got electronic warfare, you've got attack on the source, all those things that go into it. You're probably still talking roughly 300 missiles and something gets, 300 missiles are launched in one go, still something gets through at some point. But what does it hit? Does it hit the carrier, or does it hit one of the destroyers or one of the escorts? Either way, you're out of defences. The problem is, with saturation attacks... though, is that modern defense systems are designed around getting kills, which is in many ways the peacetime mentality. They're designed around killing your opponent, whereas if you look in World War II, they were designed around breaking up the attacks and making them more difficult. So you need to start rethinking your air defense plan. You need to get on a war fit a footing, because one missile coming in, it can probably be taken care of. Ten missiles coming in at once, that's a problem. A hundred missiles coming at once, that's a very big problem. Three hundred missiles coming in at once, you're up the... Mm. So you've got to make sure you manage the situation so you're not in a scenario where three hundred aircraft, three hundred missiles are firing uh, back at once. And that's going to require skill, but also luck on, on your side. <clears throat> Vision, in the gymnasium in Annapolis, there is a, a high up by the arch window, there is a huge model of the USS Antium, a Java class steam frigate that was never commissioned, model used by the Academy instructors in the 1980s and 90s. Hmm, cool. Hello, Harry Chris 444. Um, Battletech Megware has an insane amount of lore. I know. I have done a bit of a, a, a bit of scrapping around looking at it. But it, it's something I haven't got into in much enough that much detail yet. 
So, Thompson, if the locomotive steam engine had been laid by 80 to 100 years, how many more canals would have been seen and what repercussions on mass transit would have had today? Ooh. If that's delayed by a century, then you have a lot more canals. But the thing is, canals are also in a, sense a product of the steam engine because they're still they're horse drawn, but as they get more efficient, they are themselves engine and they are themselves coal powered, and that's the same with ships. So if you don't, for some reason you don't have engines taking off in terms of um, shit in terms of locomotives for some reason then you're also going to end up with issues for canal power now you'll probably keep going on with it and keep developing it but also remember railways were not just those which were powered by steam there were other methodologies going on so you might well have railways developed which are i don't know link railways or other forms of rope and pulley railways also involved so Basically, it's a complicated one. We probably see more canals, yes. We might even see canals stretching across the entire America. They, instead of being the trans, you know, the Trans American Railroad, it'll be the Trans American Canal. That could be interesting. Building canal route right across America would be very interesting. When are you going to show us the Patreon Choice other books? Well, nice to go everyone. Might come up after this one. Who knows? Once this disappears, it might be replaced by something. Nice to go everyone. So, hydrographic trawl is an earlier version of the ocean research vessel. Um, It's a version of it. It's not the earliest version of it. Sloops were used for the same things as well at the same time. Hi, Michael Patton. The enemy just fired 300 uh, uh, service anti-ship missiles at us. Well, the second task force should have a clear run. Also, time for an emergency to run. It would be interesting, yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, having uh, even a hundred missile swarm organized takes a lot, but then how many ships get into the threat axis from a carrier group to be able to Find their missiles. Probably all of the ships which are area air defense vessels will get involved in it, and any point defense frigate which that swarm is going across. Here you go, here are the options for the patron vote today. Anak Q, did small tube boilers operate at the same pressure, or was the greater power due, just due to the l larger surface area? Combination of two. There came a point at which pressures were upgrading, so they operated at a higher pressure, but they also had a larger surface area, so they're more efficient. That's it. Would Putin try to seize the unfinished Slava, class, Slava cruiser? Um, unfinished Slava cruiser. If I'm not mistaken, that's already gone to the um, breakers yard, hasn't it? Ukraine. Um, it was the ship remains untouched as of twenty twenty one. It's in Miklovia. Uh that's an interesting scenario. Um, ooh. It was launched in 1990, so it has been sitting probably uncared for, unmaintained for 32 years. Uh, uh, 
Oh, my lord. That would thing would take a lot of work. It's in Maclovia, so yeah, which isn't far from Kearson, and that's a critical shipyard that was for the Russians. That built a constant, I was building constant class, built seven Kara class, four Krislavas, um, 18 Skoys. A load of submarines. Wow. Yeah, um... I, I suppose he might go for it, but honestly, if he gets it, I'm not sure how he does anything with it. It's 30 years from launch, and it would require a lot of work, a huge amount of work, a humongous, mahusive amount of work to actually get it viable. Um, if they could seize it, they'd probably want to use it, because that would be ego talking. But um, honestly, there's a reason the Ukrainians haven't done anything with it. And also, nicest way, what's the betting the Ukrainians have, have put charges on it just in case the Russians do try and seize it so they can blow it uh, in place? Should we not treat Russia as not Soviet Union bear that would overrun Europe anymore? You should, you should never discount it completely, because presumably they'll go away and learn their lessons. And presumably they will. Why hasn't Ukraine finished that slur and taken us to the flagship? It would be incredibly expensive, difficult, and y you would have to do many changes to design, because honestly, the Slava class design is not the best design in the world. Cody85, hello Cody, thank you for the super chat. Um, what, would be the, what would the early part of the Pacific War look like if all the USN's fast oilers had been converted to flight deck oilers, assuming each carried eight fighters and six Coda Seagulls and basic AAA? Uh, well, A, the USN would have a lot more air power for its defense, its forces, a lot more fighters. Um, B, those oilers themselves wouldn't be that massively helpful, but they would mean any convoys would be far more secure, so that would allow you to play more fast and loose with your carriers and your actual forces. Right, here are the questions we have for Patron. Glenn Stewart, cruises and cruiser actions of the Spanish-American War. Thank you very much, Glenn. Colin Cameron, Malta Under Siege. Colin, you do love this subject, and at some point I'm hoping someone's going to vote for it and do it. I have to say, there are, I do have, fa I do, I, I think I can do all these justice, but I do have some favourites of them. Um... And I do love the way Colin has put in Malta Under Sieges probably pretty much every month for the last four or five months now, I think. Um, I, I haven't gone back and checked, but that's just what it feels like. And he keeps gaming going, I'm going to put it forward, I'm going to get it forward. And it keeps doing well, but it doesn't actually win. But there is coming a point where I'm just going to take it out and just do it. It's like there's another, there's a couple here which are just tempted for me to do as long patrols anyway. Um, sea Dodders, likely scenario if the Washington Naval Treaty is not renewed by the London Naval Treaties. 
that's a really interesting one because you still have the impact of the Washington Treaty on ship design, ship construction, but then you don't have the London Treaties renewing it. So instead of having the 1930 sort of 36 treaties, you have Washington end. Washington ceases to exist in, well, it would filter out in roughly 1933. At which point you have World War Two, uh, you have the rearmament programs start to begin in World War for nineteen thirty three, rather than in nineteen thirty seven, which means you have four more years of advanced construction going on. So goodness knows what kind of fleet you end up fighting actually World War Two with. I think for the U.S. I would I don't think the U.S.N. would get the funding as soon as the Royal Navy. I think the Royal Navy would get the funding from nineteen thirty four. I think the U.S. Navy would have to wait till about 1937-38, as they did in real life. Um, but it would cause problems for a lot of people because if the Royal Navy start pumping up their construction in 34, then well, the Germans will be way behind. The Italians will probably find themselves in trouble, and the Japanese could also find themselves in trouble because the RN could quite quickly double their carrier production. The RN could quite quickly double their battleship construction the rn could quite quickly double these things yes they would have to it would it would take time to get the infrastructure going to the level at which to support that build but they'd have a four year head start on what they were doing and instead of starting that process in 1937 they'd be starting it back in 1934 when actually more of that infrastructure was also around in the first place and didn't need rebuilding it just needed reconditioning so it would be interesting um, so thanks for that. Thanks, C. Dollars. Aaron Evans. Perfect operation. The 1862 capture of New Orleans. Cool one to have from the U.S. Civil War. Um, in car, scabber flow. It's genesis, creation, usage, and potential future. Mm hmm Andrenor. Roman naval logistics and how they supported their campaigns. I'm fairly certain for any long patrol that I'm going to have to get one of my friends to record the video with me. Uh, Paul from Chicago. Baltic operations in the Crimean War. Mm hmm Samuel Spratt, Submarine Mine Layers of Water 1. Always fun. I'm going to say, what if the Kriegsmarine used diesel power to power everything? Diesel to power everything. Rather than working with high pressure steam and turbines, what if they went with diesel for everything? An interesting idea. Might actually affect their fuel usage and give them more fuel lands. Um, Samuel Spratt, Foreign Station Flagships of the Victorian Royal Navy. Ooh. Vision, Soviet Surface Raiders, Cold War Ship Strategy and Tactics of Gird the Course. As you all know, I did write an article a few years ago, which is was put up first on British naval history and then on global maritime uh, global maritime history, uh, which is on the Sveldov class. And honestly, I think I could do a good basis of that from that. And Richard Basava, Japan will not surrender and has to be invaded by sea. What would it have looked like? Oh, massive. Dr. Locke, has anyone seen that about an hour ago Drac has stolen the Declaration of Independence? Oh, not again. Seriously, I should never let him watch that Nicolas Cage movie. The moment he saw that Nicolas Cage movie, it's best been... Mm. Trudium, do you keep a list of Patreon poll losers to look at for future topics lists? I do put some interesting ones aside. When If they interest me, but they lose, then they get uh, put aside. And I do remember them. I was asking, Ukraine's also scuttled their frigate in Mikhailov Harbor, uh, Harbor, so the waterway from the shipyard is probably blocked as well. Also, on this from the Russians, I'd rather put, uh, push back. Hmm. Now, Tyrion, what will what will other navies learn from Moscow's demise? Uh, the importance of all around radar coverage and probably damage control, which are things that they should have known anyway. Honestly, there are uh, there are issues in the Russian military, and I honestly think. 
that Putin is possibly starting to realize this. But there are issues. The Russian military has... I, I, if I was Putin, I would have said the one area you cannot corrupt is the military, where corruption is not allowed. But it's caused a lot of problems. Uh, it, there's always going to be corruption in the way the Russian system is uh, set up as it is set up now and run. But uh, yeah, the mil allowing corruption to get into the military as much as it has has led to what this is an issue in Ukraine. Because a simple reading of the stats and the capabilities which the Russians should have had at their availability, especially logistics-wise, uh, was mass. Oh, should have been an easy victory. But as I said before, six hours. They if the war's over in six hours, they've won it. Six days, they've won it. Six weeks, things are getting iffy. Six months. You're in a lot of trouble. Um, I would point out that if Mika if the Moskva has not been sunk and had not been sunk, I would have expected to see it being paraded in front of the world's media right about now. It would be on every single television screen the Russians could put it. So it's sunk. Uh, there is a debate, of course, as to how why it's sunk. Um, it, was, it could well have been sunk by fire, but what caused that fire? Was it a missile strike, or was it bad maintenance of their missiles aboard the ship? That's the question. And I do enjoy the fact that the Russians would prefer it be considered due to their own bad maintenance and malpractice than actually hit by the Ukrainians. I find it interesting that they would prefer they prefer it to that. But there again, you see some sources, and it's Avenge Moscow, which suggests that it was the Ukrainians who sunk it. So yeah, it's, it's complicated. That's Aaron. Hood might have been pulled in for a refit earlier. I, if the London Naval Treaties aren't signed, yeah, I'm fairly certain Hood and Repulse both get a refit earlier. Especially as they don't have the limitations. That's Aaron. Did recapture New Orleans? Did the Union just read up on the mistakes of the British in 1815? To an extent, but also, I have to admit, the Confederates are just absolutely atrocious. Hello, Goglana. It's running. Do not invade Ukraine. Mm. Good evening. I had in one doc documentary, Allied war planners were pl planning on bringing 106 divisions to bear on Japan in June 1946. I'm fairly certain that was up, it was up there in that numbers. It would have been interesting. Anuk, what would World War II German designs look like if the Treaty of Versailles hadn't forbidden Germany's building warships? Would they be more balanced? Yeah, they would be more balanced. They've had a few more generations. That's the other thing as well. If you don't have the treaties st artificially stopping the US Navy and the Royal Navy getting generations in, then it could be the Royal Navy could have built a whole new generation of battleships and be building the next generation after them by time 1939 rolls around. So if you've got, let's say, again, you use 1934 as the figure when the, the Washington Naval Treaty runs out, and to be honest, The, expert, the Washington Naval Treaty was technically supposed to expire on December 31st, 1936. However,
The fact is they do the renegotiations of the London Treaty in 1930. And without the renegotiations of the London Treaty in 1930, there are a lot of things which are not codified into the treaty system. And probably they have to break it off early because the London Treaty negotiations without that going through, if that breaks down, then the treaty system breaks down. And I'm, I said, 1934-ish, it's gone. Seems appropriate. In which case, you could well get the Royal Navy, they could build their King George V's 19, uh, let's say, order a couple in 1934, order a couple more in 1935. They're probably in service by 1937, 38. And honestly, the British probably order another couple in 19 of ships in 1936, 37, which would be in service by 1939. So they'll be getting a couple of battleships each year. Coming into service, brand new ones. So the RN could have six or so brand new ships in service by the time World War II rocks around. And honestly, the fact is, the, US, uh, the, the fact is, the British can build far more ships than the Germans can, etc. And if the Germans are still building Shan a couple of Sharnors and a couple of this and a couple of that. The British have churned out six, eight new ships. The Japanese can't match that. So the Japanese... Basically, this is the thing about the treaty system. The people it impinges most are the US Navy and the Royal Navy. Because they have the most infrastructure. The moment you have that, you have the treaty system out of the way. Those two have the ability to either build the, generate the infrastructure or regenerate the infrastructure. Which can allow them to churn out ships. If they want to. If they want to put the money behind it, they can do it. And the uh, moment you have that out of the way, they can build ships. I think my sister seems to think it's wrong for the military to lie about what the Invincibles were. Do you mean the battle cruisers or the through deck cruisers? So the battle cruisers are the large large cruisers, that's what they are. And through deck cruisers are This is the Royal Navy. Dr. Johnson, Dr. Clark, your train of Ford Muscular is rather a reminiscent of a movie I watched last night. Finally saw Hunter Killer from 2018. Parts were great, others were not so. Yeah, Hunter Killer is an interesting movie. That was Moscow, task confirmed Moscow is sinking in tow after a fire. But again, was the fire caused by UA Neptune or an old malfunctioning P-1000? We do not know this time. Yeah, and honestly, if it was sinking after tow, I would expect more of the crew to be recovered. And I know they did that lovely parade, but I was highly suspicious of that group. Because, this is going to sound strange, basically that suggests that the only people on parade were the people who were completely unharmed. And if you've been firefighting on a ship of Moscow size enough to kill her for it to be sunk, there isn't going to be a single member of crew who does not have cuts, scrapes, bruises, does not have damage from smoke inhalation, is not going to be in a fit state really to stand on parade. And also, if they're standing on parade, there are going to be expect a few of them to break down at some point when they look around and their mates aren't there after standing on parade. So I don't trust those images. I don't know how many of the crew were lost. I have no method of estimating it, but it honestly, it could be anything from all of them to none of them, I don't know, but my suspicion is it's more, a lot more than half. From the reality of a ship which is burning enough fire to go, and again, if you have ships close enough to assist in taking it under tow, 
You theoretically have ships which are there enough to assist in putting on, uh, helping out with fire control, i.e. turning on their own mains and helping with the fire control, which if they're not, suggests that you're worried about serious things cooking off and taking out those ships as well. I, I'm just wondering if we have a rerunning of the Titanic scenario with bad damage control. And then you have the, on the Moskvas, of course, the Slava class, are the generation of, and they haven't been upgraded, unlike the Peter Veliki, which apparently has been upgraded with it, they don't have a centralized fire alarm system. So they have a sectional fire alarm system, which means you could have had a fire start and it could be sections of the crew wouldn't know the fire was going on. It's all, it's something which I'm not going to discuss in too much detail here because when Drac gets back, we are going to sit, and me, Jamie, and Drac are going to sit down, and I'm probably going to see if one of our usual guests is free as well to sit down with us and go through what we know about the Moskva and what might be happening. Might, might happen. Gene, I'm going to say, on the heart, how does the UK pay for those generations of battleships? Mm, honestly, in the 1930s, they can afford it. It's yes, it's expensive, but if you consider, and this is the example I tend to give, and if I add in the add source image file, and I go new history live, UK defense spending. Da -da 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 bum bum. I was looking at it earlier. Yeah. There you go. This is UK defence spending as a percentage of GDP. And if you look very carefully, you'll notice in the 1930s, it doesn't really go much above 3%. So honestly, you'd be talking about upping it to 4%. Yes, it's going to be expensive, but it's not going to be massively expensive. They can afford it by... Possibly increasing taxes, but more likely knowing the British did just slightly slow down the payment back of the debt from First World War, which is not a, not, not a fun thing, but it's something they can do. So they can afford it. It's And, they, and the, trust me, again, the British would consider it... How do I put this? Under a treaty system where no one's allowed to build, it's better to pay back the money quick, more quickly. Under a system where people are building, well, your A, the money employs people in the UK, B, it helps employ, it provides impl it provides jobs around the UK, which is all good. And C, it's providing you defense of your empire, which is the main thing which holds your empire together, but your ability to defend it. And that's the point. If you can't rely on the treaty to hold the peace, then you've got to build the ships. So there are reasons why they would pay for it. Oh, to answer your questions, Clint. It's always fun when I get good questions. Um, Geo guy, what was the proposed British contribution to Operation Downfall in troops in troops and ships if it went forward? Oh, it would have been a huge Pacific fleet, British Pacific fleet, and it was discuss basically discussed that it was going to be, they reckon by D plus two, until they had, la they had land air bases set up and fully functioning and running and supplied, it was going to be only British carriers which were still around to provide support as they felt the kamikazes would cause that much damage to US Navy carriers. Um, British contribution to the downfall in terms of troops would have been a fair number of divisions from the British and Commonwealth forces. Probably the US would have been providing uh, two thirds of the forces involved, but their most a bulk of the remainder would come from Britain and Commonwealth, with the bulk of them probably coming from Britain. Uh, Colonel Cameron, the invasion of Ukraine Russian logistic problems make me think the Soviet arms sales in uh, Nicolas Cage's uh, film Lord of War were actually documentary. It is fairly accurate. Nice well, one lesson we can take from Moscow, externally mounted weapons are a bad idea. Hmm. Who'd have thought, after years of the joys of torpedoes on ships' decks, we didn't know that one, did we? 
Code 85. Better than what's happening with the US's bond on Richard. The US only is trying to blame a sailor when it was their only laziness. Um, honestly, the sailor caused it, I think, is the, is the result. But the reason that there was so much damage, as we discussed in bilge pumps with Sal, and as we discussed at the time, is because of the issues that have affected the US Navy. Nice to um, Carriers, they'd be building up as well. As I said, it would probably be based around Arc World to sign. It'd be searching on, searching on them. You'd probably get something audacious multi-sized quite quickly. Um, if you have no treaty system. And doesn't the UK and US building ships make uh, Japan more angry at find? More than likely, but there's Japan can't doesn't have the infrastructure to build more. And that's their trouble. Japan doesn't have the infrastructure. So Japan can start building ships. So they can build their two super battleships. But the trouble is... No, oh, look at what the British have in place. Look at what the Americans are building. Here you go. I wonder if the Russians would hold Moscow's crew in command of color like Japan used to when they lost the major surface unit. Um, it's interesting. Interesting. CM McDevitt, I heard there were six foot waves and up to 35 mile per hour winds in the area of time. Probably. But if there were, that makes it even more difficult for the shit. Uh, uh, that. You'd still expect more crew to survive. See, daughters, we'll only likely find out when the wreck is dived on by people not beholden to the Russian government to remain quiet about what they find. Probably. Probably. If they can ever find it, and if it's not blown up by the Russians before then. Consider it, which is, of course, why the UK wants a treaty, so they didn't have to pay for chips. No, because they wanted to pay back the... They wanted to pay back debt more quickly, and they wanted to be able to defend. But the thing is, if you don't have the treaties, then you have to, then you pay for the ships. The British government is quite the British government is quite efficient at this point in that, in that effect. But that's, it's kind of different from today, in that the moment the treaties go, it, and it's if you look at it, it's very quick. The moment the treaties are over, boom, shipbuilding programs begin. That's the whole thing. Henderson prepare, spends 1933 to 1937 preparing for a shipbuilding program. And then the moment it's 1937, and boom, open up taps. Treaties aren't work, start not working, start building. And that's why you have all these ships coming into service in 1939, 1940, 1941, and then the big surge in 1942 is all that construction program. And the build up and maintenance of that. So basically, you just schedule that back a bit. And remember again, the British, the interesting thing about the British is that in 1932, they do drop the 10 year rule. So, if you have that still happen as historically, and you don't have the London Naval Treaty from 1930, has it been agreed, then 1932, 1934 for letting go of the taps and starting the construction program makes sense. So anyway, how would satellite surveillance by the US and the UK change World War II? Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, satellite surveillance would give them... Well, if you've got satellite surveillance, you also have satellite communications. Which means you can probably spot what the Germans are doing, you can spot what the Italians are doing, and you can spot what the Japanese are doing, where they're marshalling troops, where they're organising airfields, etc. And you just have that much more information, especially if the other side doesn't have it. If you have satellite communications as well, you can guarantee instantaneous information in full detail getting everywhere. Because it's secure. It's secure line of sight communication, practically. Um, from, thanks to the satellite systems, because it comes down a very, very narrow beam. So if you have satellite comms and satellite, reckon, uh, satellite surveillance going on, mm, World War II gets a lot shorter. Especially if the, U if the UK and US only have it. Are the owners will have it. What would be stopping the IGN from starting World War II early? Because if you think the US and the UK are in a bad position in 1934, 
you should look at what the IJN position is. And remember, in the IJN position 1934, they don't have Vietnam, in French Indochina, aka okay, Vietnam, they don't have all those places which they use as their starting points. It goes back to the issues which I talked about when I was talking about what happens if World War II breaks out in 19, January 1939 with the uh, Singtown incident. Because in the nicest way, if that happens, then you are in trouble. So anyway, I don't know what the status of the British division is, but they might have been more veteran than the US since the best US formations are basically just shells at a point of downfall. It would have been interesting in that I'm fairly certain the British and the US divisions that have been fought, fighting in Europe will be going over and retooling. Um, things like the 101st Airborne, etc. would be really critical in the early days of the assault and having those parachute divisions go in as part of the amphibious assault, probably they would be dropped at the same time as landings, rather like D-Day, would be dramatically important. Right, the Type 31 with Mark 41 and VLS is very similar for Poland, Ukraine, and Indonesia. What about Philippines and Vietnam? You can make the case for it for all of them. But it's only sensible in terms of a flagship and having a couple of them. Especially for Ukraine, if you've got the, if you've got the Black Sea. In a nice way for the Ukrainians, as I said... You basically want SSKs and you want small attack craft. Bisbee, Skull, those sort of things. So anyway, the satellite network is set up, is set up in 1933. Oh, good lord. At which point you're probably getting really good looks at the constructions of German ships and Japanese ships. In which case, you can tell what's inside them. <laughs> 290. I'm happy to see that the Ukrainian surprise we talked about when we met in London appears to have come true in the most spectacular way. Certainly was interesting in that you and I were having that conversation. I think it was on the train station platform, chatting away. And, um, yeah, we had that conversation, and then this has happened. So anyway, they can't use the missiles for military use, so the military tech stays the same, only the satellite zones. Well, it would also be satellite communications, and in the nicest way, if you have the ability to launch something up into the atmosphere, you can get something to come down. So yeah, they also have a strike capacity, in which case I would not want to be a surface ship sitting in harbour, because they could get it so that they could hit that place within 45 minutes. Madam Brugnes, when it comes to sequestering the crew, as someone just said, I'd say it's likely. When the hotel class SBN K-19 uh, suffered a reactor breakdown upon return, the crew were isolated for weeks prior to being sent to different boats in Normandy. And no, and no, it was not entirely due to radiation. I can understand that, but I would suggest with the Moscow, they'd be wanting to do a full public display of how many people survived. Then again, okay, now what changes the access to satellite surveillance and comms? Ouch! They still have problems in that they don't have as much resources, but in the nicest way, they are going to be able to tell where the British ships are, they're going to be able to plot out their avoidance of them, they're going to be able to plot out everything, they, they're, they're going to have Dean, they're going to have <coughs> basically they're going to be, it's like they're going to be able to do a they're doing an exam where the idea is to come up with competing blind answers and, you know we've all sort of there's all been all sorts of exams like that in time, but if you're basically doing a double blind scenario of what you'd be doing operationally and whereas one side can read what the opponent's doing, the other side can't. So that'd be it. They wouldn't know necessarily why the British are doing what they're doing, but they'd be able to see them massing up. They'd be able to see D-Day, all the ships being amassed, where they're being amassed, what they're being organised. They'd be able to see everything coming. Again, 
Um, nice to hear everyone. I know the 54 keep being rumored as being rescued by a Turkish ship, but there is one showman who is usually reliable and it's called Aragon. And I'm sorry, if 54 Turkish sailors have been rescued by a Turkish ship, I would expect Aragon to be making a massive thing of it. I expect him to be greeting them as they're dropped off, as the ship comes back to Turkey in full court press there to shake their hands and check on them. Maybe a little tour of the hospital unit they're in for, uh, they're put in. You know, that is the thing I find the most dubious claim of all going on is that apparently 54 sailors have been saved by Turkey and Aragon has done no PR from it. None at all. And Dan Freeman, in, in recent hours, there is hot Jan and Feb 1959. It's even more fun if the US decides that sinking one of their ships and machine gunning decides it's an act of war in December 1957. The US's parry incident uh, with a, when a Japanese artillery unit shot up the Shot it and hit an RN gunboat, according to Wikipedia, at least. Yeah, that would have been, um, if it goes for, uh, 1937, then you've got an entire massive Royal Navy fleet going out there as well, because again, just as like the US Navy, the US couldn't afford for the British to fight Japan alone and perhaps win, the US British couldn't award the, afford the Americans to fight the Japan alone and win. It would just change under the scenario who's going to be the leading Navy because of politics. Because whoever's the aggrieved party would be the leading navy. For political reasons. See, you know, could a Lancaster tall boy or even a grandson make it to the Japanese mainland from the nearest Allied controlled airfield and make it back? Nope. Aaron Frazak. Dr. Clark, the IGN set up cruisers, uh, set up cruisers to have their guns swapped out for large ones when war was inevitable. Did anyone else look at the concept? Mm hmm. The Royal Navy did. They didn't go with it. They wanted a lot of light cruisers because the mostly they decided, well, hang on, the six inches enough. We just want more turrets. No, sorry. If the Lithuanian defense minister is accurate, then four hundred thirty-one of the four hundred uh, of the Moscow's four hundred ninety-five crew didn't make it. That's if the fifty-four went off to the Turkish ship. We'll see what happens. Ungoza, resatellite network in 1933. Oh, what? Prevent missile blitz in 1940. Oh, they could prevent all sorts of things. Sijin 90, do you have any knowledge of how good Russian naval damage control is? I don't indirectly, directly, but um, indirectly I've heard things, and directly in my own experience of going through damage control training with the Royal Navy. Uh, which I have been lucky to take part slash observe in at FOST several times. That's fleet uh, flag officer sea training, some department down in uh, down in the UK uh, off the coast of the UK. I will say off the coast of the UK because theoretically it's Plymouth, but um, yeah, let's be honest, they run all the way up and down the channel whenever they feel like it. And if you've ever been on a ship going through FOST. I've done it as a researcher, I've done it as all sorts of things, and been invited to sort of take part so I can understand it for my work. The sheer amount of training which goes into damage control is absolutely obscene, but is absolutely necessary. Every person on that ship has to be a firefighter, every person on that ship has to be a carpenter, every person on that ship has to be able to assess what they're seeing in front of them and deal with it, because you don't know who's going to be the first person through the door. You don't know who is going to be the first person to deal with it. The amount of training they go through, the, the command and control systems they have in place for managing it. And there are the command and control systems for managing a single impact, a single incident, and then there's the way you run when you've got a multiple in a multi-impact incident, i.e., you've got more than one hit, and the way you run it and damage, and that's an, an entire layer above that. So all I can say is, if you want to run that well, 
you need to be very, very well trained. And you need to train it regularly. And you need to think things through a lot. And that takes a lot of money and a lot of time. And what are we seeing from the Russian military at the moment? We're seeing they're falling down on things which take a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of consistency. Because they've taken the easy shortcut route. Because that saved them money and allowed them to use money for other things. And that's where they're falling apart. So that makes me worried about the damage control on their ships. I'm basing it off their army, to an extent, and what they've been doing, and my own experiences. But that would be my thought through assessment. There's a nice song about one of Werner von Braun about rockets and how it's only it is only his business to make them go up, not where they go down. Hmm. If the Atkus had orbit cable launches in 1940, they would have won. They'd have uh, they have ICBMs. Mm-hmm. Sonorak, in 1934, around when people would have been abandoned the treaties if they knew it was going to start in when it did. Um, probably. If you had a premonition, that's about when you'd start. To be honest, the British weren't that far off. You consider that most people were predicting 1942 and the uh, mid the mid 1940s, and the British got rid of the ten year rule in a uh, year, uh, year rule in 1932. They're only out by three years for a government. That's practically accurate. Repraiser, how does equipped for but not with work? If I have the room wiring electrical capacity and plumbing for System X, what am I using the space for until it's installed? Surely I don't have empty space. That's pretty much what you have. In Type 45s, they have literally an extra gym because they're not using that VLS space for anything else. So it's a gym. And I just move the equipment out and put in the stuff in. Were the missiles that got on sales truck launched or air launched? Truck, I think. Bill Williams, being a former RN, any officer, lo any loss of life at sea is sad, but blame Putin's ego. Yeah. At the moment, uh, there's all the old rule that the moment the people are in the water, they start to cease being your enemy because they're now fighting to see your common threat and you try and rescue them. You do your best. I think, I think an Arvro Lincoln could have with a tall boy. I think with a bit of work, and possibly. Duck Clark, a critical advantage of the United States in World War II was the fact we were not subjected to sustained air attack. If we were, how would I affect the war? Oh, expect a lot more rude. Uh, expect a lot more. Um, war would have go on longer, but also expect the uh, Americans to get far, far more um, <clears throat> nasty in it. I think if Moscow did sink with two nuclear wars aboard, uh, warheads aboard, how bad is that? Not bad so much as it's an issue. It's an issue. It's something which we're going to have to think about and worry about. All right, so does something the size of a Slava have any business in the back seat? You, if you're Russia, it does. It's your big status unit. It's your capital ship. Interesting. I wonder if the institutional memory of losing ships in World War II in Falklands has created some sense of priority the Russians never had. So that of which was cheap route got skewed. No, I think it's just generally the corruption which is the fact of Russian and logistics. Nathan, congrats on being the man of honor. It is gonna be fun. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's up there, isn't it? A wedding week. Not mine, but due to Man of Honor duties with the wedding's par party date and might be... Uh, the wedding party date uh, and uh, night might be... Uh, uh, with the wedding party date might be changed. Uh, yes, uh, technically the weddings are... The, the wedding date is spread across the 28th and to the morning on the 29th. 
and with someone on twenty seventh. So that's the free night. Uh, that that's the time, and I am technically in a hotel from the twenty seventh to the twenty ninth, sorting things out, running around, being man of honor. Um, I hope I'm going to be able to be of use and be of service and helping my friend out and making sure she has a wonderful day. I'm fairly certain at some point I'm going to be tempted to use a Vulcan neck pinch on someone. I'm hoping I manage to avoid it. So anyway, what is your favorite meme of the Russian-Ukraine war? Mm, there have been so many good ones. There have also been so many bad ones. But Williams, having that, having been in damage control authorities, not going and not got time to be scared, just get the job done. Only afterwards will we uh, did we uh, afterwards um, no, we did that. Yeah. Perhaps Ukraine can offer Russia a replacement of that Slava that was hull sitting in McLaurin. No, it's, as I said earlier, it's 30 years old. Frankly, no. Reverend, I think you should do 54 live from the reception. No. No. I'll, 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 besides, actually, no. If you want to see, um, I do talk about him sometimes. Um, Dave Steggles. Who I've got a I think I've got a link to somewhere I talked about on a couple of occasions. Um, is the bride's father, and he does this whole channel on mo on bo building model ships. Really, really nice guy. Really, really cool, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I said, well, a Russian TV pundit saying the Moscow sinking is enough to go to war. Well, if you're not really fighting a war, that might explain why you're losing so many stu stuff. Um, CJ Knight, I wonder if a certain Seawall sub, uh, class sub is in the med that might be able to take a short trip to examine what the Moscow might have been carrying. Ah, who knows? Sea Dodders, does Japan have rivers capable of supporting a decent amount of riverine warfare in the event of downfall? Hmm, they do have some interesting rivers. I doubt that, and it's not the massive network. It could certainly be interesting. What's the last Russian ship sunk in World War II? I have no idea. I think it was a destroyer, though, from memory. United, there is a geopolitician who said that the rest of the Black Sea fleet might last another six months, which I think seems excessively optimistic. Myself, I think, I, I let's put it this way, there is the problem that quite a lot of commentators like me were going, well, yeah, that fire could have been started by Ukrainian missiles, but it could also have been started by the damage done to the fleet. Is Glenn Stewart that Glenn Stewart or Happy Accident? No, he is that Glenn Stewart. Um, Senator, Senator Canero, farmers, uh, farmers towing tanks is fun, but war, Russian warship go frigate yourself was fun and when it did, lol. Mm. It's honestly the thing that's often forgotten and the thing that's most difficult to organize. And this is something which I find, I'd say, again, I like in Glynn's books, Stuart's books, but, um, and I like in the ones I talk about, uh, DJ Holmes and a few others books, they do talk about the logistics of it. And that is always something I enjoy when they do, I do mention that in science fiction. But it's something which is easily forgotten, and I honestly think the Russian Navy in the Black Sea has probably got about two months or three months of operating at this tempo before they are out of it, because they haven't got 
they are going to be out of it and out of it completely. And that's going to be... And I'm, I'm just going to quickly flick that. Flynn, I hope you don't mind, but I adapted your question suggestion to that, so I hope you like it. Uh, so, the... And that's going to be an interesting thing. It's, it, as I said, as I said at the beginning when I first asked a question about Ukraine. If, they, if the war lasts six hours, the Russians win. If it lasts six days, the Russians win. If it lasts six weeks, the Russians probably won. Six months, they're in trouble. It's now well past the six-hour stage, well past the six-day stage, well past the six-week stage. It's getting on the heading for the six-month stage. And we are seeing the infrastructure, we are seeing the issues with the Russian and in the terms of depth of actual equipment falling uh, coming about. The Russians are going to be in trouble. The question is going to be how the Russians react to this. And what do they go with? Decision 90. Battleship Marat was a permanent loss after battle got blown off by Stukas near Leningrad. I know, Marat was just not as um, resolute as Eskimo was to be in the war. You know, losing a bow stopped Marat. Eskimo would have just, uh, if Adrian was Eskimo had been near at the time, she'd just gone, you know what, you just carry on, you go stern first now, turn around, turn around and start doing it. You're just not doing it properly, shit. Come on, follow me. This is how you do it. Rapper Razeback, why does Aaron pronounce spell my name with a P instead of a B? Hmm? Rabid Razorback? Hmm. Not sure. Desert Foxo, Ethiopia drives out the Italians from Somalia and Eritrea in the first Ethiopian Italian war. How do you build a navy to keep access to the sea and stop the Italians reinvading? Destroyers and submarines, buy them from Britain. And get the offer the British basing rights. Quickest way to stop the Italians coming back off of the British basing rights for the Indian Ocean Squadron. I was like, you should have him on sci-fi brew ships. Actually, I'm tempted to try and get Glyn on the sci-fi, on a sci-fi bilge pumps to discuss that, because I think he'd be really cool to have. Oh, good lord. What's Kate been saying on Instagram? I haven't watched it today. If anyone knows who wants to know which Kate I'm discussing, it's Kate Gnameson, and Dan has just sent me a picture of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw that earlier. She does have a lot of fun with those ones. See, daughters, have the Russians crept themselves in any worse long wars than Germany? It seems so. Um, Dan Freeman, as Chieftain did a nice response, a repost, a repost to suggestion that the tank is dead. There is also the argument that tanks deployed without poor doctrine support are dead, but that isn't news. That is the trouble. That's what the Russians have been doing. It's been very poor doctrine at certain points. They've been going against their own doctrine. Mr. Didn't Eskimo have practice at Sodom Mobile half twice? Yep. You know, just it, just lost my bow, carrying on, still fighting the enemy. Uh, Nubian loses her stern. Yeah, still going to an uh, war. So I'm going to show you. You got my email. Yes, we will. Be, we will. Uh, th th as I said, it's if we get uh, do, do it, which we are. We, we keep trying to do these things, and I, I said this with Bill Trump. We keep trying to schedule things in advance and working out and having guests on. And then Ukraine goes and blows up a Russian cruiser, potentially. And suddenly we have to reschedule everything and work out what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be doing that. It's just, 2022 is just nullifying my planning. It's just terrible. But we will invite you. Decision 90, Russia cannot rebuild after war. Can they afford not to rebuild after war? That's the bigger trouble. They're going to have to, and where they're going to find the money and the technology to do it is going to be the problem.
Colonel Cameron, I've heard that the Black Sea is one of the areas overrun with jellyfish. Does this affect how ships' coolant intakes have to be set up to stop them breaking down? Yes. Digital 90. Demographic and economically, this was their last shot. Mm, I can agree with that one to an extent. But they're going to have to try. Well, they're completely out of it. And in which case, Russia probably starts to break up at some point. Which could cause us a whole other trouble. Because if Russia starts to break up... Look at who's going to be taking over the regions, and look at who's going to have the nuclear weapons in their regions. You don't want to go there. That's it. Yeah, over a month, three weeks, and four days. Yeah, it's well past the six-week mark now. Marat stayed in the fight, firing and surviving 12-inch guns. If I was Stalin, I I would have plopped those turrets and guns onto the incomplete hull in Leningrad of their battlecruiser. Could have been good. It'll be interesting what happens in, Germany, in Russia. Go, go, Landa. For the Iron Brew. By the way, what does it taste like? I can't find it here in Sicily. You cannot really describe the taste of Iron Brew, but honestly, and I, I, I say this in the nicest way, it's actually described on the uh, on the bottle as. Brewed in Scotland since 1901 to a secret recipe of 32 flavours with a spirit that's as bold as its taste. You can't describe it because there's nothing like it. And that's pretty much it. It is unique. It's sort of like drinking iron-flavoured candy floss. I have no idea how that sounds, but it, 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 it if you like it, you really like it. If you don't, you're going to get scared of it. Graham Heinle, always when talking about Russia and its military, mass get Ah, uh, yes. But also, remember that Russia has a lot of nuclear weapons. So whilst 96831, you might be right, they could be a middle power status. They're going to be a nuclear armed superpower in terms of nuclear weapons, in terms of numbers of them. So that's your problem. <clears throat> I spent some time on that square, but that was the frigate. She didn't use her bow as an expendable weapon. Mr. You, you really can't describe I miss sometimes. But I mean, yeah, what is it about people who are interested in ships and ship designs and who write about sci-fi and naval history and drinking iron brew? I mean, and if we have beards especially, we all seem to drink iron brew. Even Prof. Lambert has been known to, to, to take of this stuff. So, um, yeah. We can all be slightly worried that it does seem to be a unifying factor Amongst the naval historians and the those of naval naval enthusiasts and science fiction enthusiasts around the world do seem to enjoy iron brew. It's almost like we've gone right then. We like to be our own people. Everyone else wants to drink Coke and Pepsi. We've got to go a different way. So we we'll go a completely different way with iron brew. Anuk, winner in Russia-Ukraine war is China. That's the scary thing. Remember, is it? there is a great meme floating around where they said, history repeats itself. I didn't expect it to cover the 20th century in 22 years. Just the 20th century? Um, I think we've covered the 20th century almost in the last three years in the 2020s, not let alone the previous ones.
Dude, honest, I heard that some handsome chap made a couple of carry conversions you'd like to look, look of, and you wish to use them in the video. Yeah, they're going to be in the treaty, the Washington Treaty Summary video. And if anyone has any more ideas for what those carrier conversions of either an Admiral class or a G3 would have looked like converted to a carrier, please draw them up, send them, a, uh, tag me in Discord on them. I will save them, they will all get added in, and I will go through them all in the summary video. Gingerfest, uh, could you block trade until Russia disarms its nukes? That's a complicated one. That is a complicated one. And of course, this week we have the Ducassine class of the Marine Nationale. Nice hearing. What was supposed to be the difference about the armor on Hood and her sisters? Basically, her, sids, her sisters had better armor. Her sister, if you consider Hood a step on the path from Battlecruiser, the fast battleship, but still very much in the Battlecruiser. Mm, her sisters are slightly further towards the fast battleship, but still battle cruiser. The G3s are slightly further towards the fast battleship, but still battle cruiser. And that they've still got the cruiser subdivision. And the main thing about a, a, a main thing I would argue about this fast battleship that separates it from the battle cruiser is it has not quite as much speed as you could put into a battle cruiser, but it still has the similar sort of level of armor you put on a battle cruiser. Mm, but it has the subdivision of a battleship to uh, that's why that doesn't have the same speed. <clears throat> that's right. So, whose common response will be first? Hmm. There's going to be a lot of comment response videos coming up because they're going to be the UAD videos while I learn how to use UAD's new systems. And I will be back in a second. I just heard some weird noise outside. Best into more heavy cruisers. That's going to be a fun one. So I'm not sure if you all heard it, but there was a bit of a whirring noise going on out there, and I was going, what's going on, what's going on? And anyway, the noise is the fox, or what we can call the feral fluffy research assistant, um, going around my, you know, there's some, there's a dryer set up in the garden for the sort of the things to be washed, sort of a, a washing pole. Uh, thing and it's set up in the garden for the washing to dry off. And he's going around, and the sheets are hanging low. It's actually pulling them round. So they've now got teeth marks on them, probably, I think. You know, not bothered. They're not my sheets. I should probably tell my sister. And the Tafra is sitting slightly further up the garden behind the gate, watching this. Pushing on the gate, trying to get through to play with the fox. And the fox is going round and round to wind up, wind up Tafra. So it's fun times going on here. Right then. Matthew, what do you think the Chinese will learn from the Russian-Ukraine war? And that's a more complicated one. What do they want to learn from the Ukraine war, Russian-Ukraine war? That's the more interesting. That, that's sort of the real question. 
I think the first thing they're going to learn is that whatever they do, they need to do it quickly. That I don't think they're going to accept that it makes it more difficult or less likely for them to succeed because that's not in the Russia and the Chinese doctrine, the Chinese thought process about Taiwan. Unification is their old, it is their thing. And if you've seen how they've approached various things in recent statements, etc., it's still very much there. They believe in the one China policy. And they believe it's inevitable. But I think they've learned that they're going to have to do it quickly. I think what's more interesting is what Taiwan might have learned. And I think Taiwan's probably learned that, you know, if they can have lots and lots of light weapons ready to deploy amongst the populace, then they can create a trouble. And the longer it goes on, the longer there is Taiwan is a separate nation from China, the lo more it builds up its own identity. Like Ukraine has resurrected, the less likely a conquest becomes, because a successful conquest becomes without a lot, and I cannot emphasize this enough, a lot of killing. There again, you have to wonder how, uh, whether, you know, the Ch uh, let's be honest, what the Russians have been doing has been a lot of killing. So, in the nicest way, you have to wonder. Is that de rigueur and, uh, and part of it? Jumak, so excited for the inter best interwar heavy cruisers. I think you're talking about the American ones which are coming up. Not sure if I'd call them the best, but they're certainly fairly decent. Um, some of them towards the end get very good. Some of the early ones are frankly interesting. A balkanized Russia has all kinds of proliferation concerns. A balkanized Russia, I can see actually both China and the West having to unite to deploy forces in to try and get rid of those nukes. To try and extract them. Because Neva's going to want those nukes going too far. This works. SS Great Eastern survives World War One. How is she used? Does that change if she survives World War Two? Uh, so freaking slow. Probably used to lay underwater sea, uh, underwater cables still across the Atlantic and various other places. But you uh, honestly, that's going to be fun. Soon, a balkanized Russia seems slightly over when you look at 1917, the surge of breakaway attempts. Yeah. I don't know. If the Russian Federation breaks up, how will that affect British planning? Uh, the world gets a lot more complicated a lot more quickly, but also it means that the um, likely biggest threat we have to start considering is China, which means, in the nicest way, the poor British army is going to be in even more trouble when it comes to securing funding. And at the moment, their big trouble is they keep complaining they haven't got enough funding, and the politicians, as I understand it from... Both, uh, whilst I do understand the opposition, I'm not going to say this out loud, the politicians from definitely the governing party, and I think the opposition to extend agree with this, that the British Army's program uh, programs have proved so undeliverable. I'm not saying the RAF ones or the Navy ones have been any better in terms of actually not having cost increases. They do have cost increases. There is uh, the fact that in defence, inflation is so much greater mainly because the incentive for com defense companies is to lowball the costs when they're selling them to the governments, because once the certain points reached in the pro project, the governments are never going to say no, so they can then put the prices up to more than they need to get their profits. So that's what they tend to structure them around, and so that's what causes some defense inflation. Because also there isn't just enough, just isn't enough throughput for them to get the profit they need for the profits they w want rather than well, need want their private companies they know it's the same thing from the constant flow of production and governments don't have the expertise inbuilt anymore to be able to moderate them it's, it's one thing dealing with supply massive suppliers like vickers and other constructors when you have your own shipyard so you can go how much would it cost you to construct that ship DNC comes back and goes, I could build it for this much. 
in this in the navy shipyard and then you go to the pot uh, to the commercial shipyard and you go you want to charge that much we can build it for that much you know what i'm gonna do mm -hmm. when you can't do that you can't do that but no the poor the army is in um the army's in problems i have to say i always thought the uh, Let's put it this way. The strike brigade, we are building a strike brigade and we are buying the wrong vehicle. And this wasn't me being cruel. This was me thinking it through and going, right then, I like the Boxer. I like the Ajax. But I don't think they're the right vehicle for the British concept of strike brigade. I would have gone with the USMC's APC. I'd have got three brigades worth of sets. I'd have told the Royal Marines, you're becoming the third strike brigade and you're going to do it amphibious-wise. And the other two brigades, and that's your strike division, which is going to permanently be set up as the the outer areas division, and it's going to have a army major general in command and a royal marine brigadier as second in command slash chief of staff. Interesting. Fox desires clean sheets potentially. The fluffy research assistant probably wasn't someone to play with uh, the feral, uh, feral fluffy research assistant. They may not own well. No, I don't think the Tafra does. But um, I, I think the Tafra wants to drive the feral fluffy research assistant away. But the feral fluffy research assistant is a lot faster than even the Tafra is. And I think she's basically going, hello. They both have bushy red tails. Did you know Taiwan has more anti ship uh, uh, Taiwan has more anti ship capability? True. They are definitely the Taiwan's military is far more sophisticated thing. I would also point out this, and this is I know I have said this before on bilge pumps, but I will say this on YouTube as well, and it's probably going to get me a lot of complaints. But I'm going to point this out. Many years ago, Israel. South Africa and Taiwan were involved in a combined joint program to develop nuclear weapons. We, uh, it was broken up, theoretically, by uh, American and Soviet agents. We know the South Africans managed to produce nuclear weapons because they ended up getting rid of them before they ended apartheid. We don't know that the Jap it's Israelis did, but we're all fairly certain they did. It's one of those things where Israel having nuclear weapons is basically an assumed fact these days. No one's going to confirm it. No one's going to deny it. It doesn't exactly exist. But we're all fair. Uh, most of us operate on the assumption that they probably do have them. What I always find interesting is that the nation which is being potentially invaded by a superpower which is the most technologically advanced of all three, has the highest number of uh, highest population in terms of technological density of all three, and therefore has the highest reason, is the one which is often presumed as not having succeeded. I might be being very optimistic in this front, but I would say if we are, high, we are sure one of those three did, and we're fairly sure a second one did. If I was China, I would be very, very conscious that the third member of those three did as well. In fact, I would be very worried because it wouldn't take that many devices to make an amphibious invasion or any invasion mm, very problematic. Mission, reading the chunk of Freeman's book right now. Definitely some interesting options there. There's lots of them. Yeah. Good one, a good book. So right, I think Taiwan is also looking long and hard about how Ukraine is managing its international image. I think, yeah, they're going for they're gonna go start pushing on social media and everything. I think they're gonna do a very forward PR campaign from that now on. CG 19. Main concern for Taiwan is how deeply China has penetrated into their hierarchy. 
that's always a concern, but I think sometimes that can be overblown. Because if we consider it, the penetration of the Ukrainian hierarchy was something that the Russians were relying on to get them a six-hour war. And they didn't get it. And again, the point I often make is when you have an opponent who's that close, that big, and that scary, you tend to get very good at counterintelligence and counter surveillance. You tend to get very, you tend to put a lot of effort into developing a very loyal, very well thought through intelligence services. I wouldn't be surprised if Taiwan's are very, very good. Go, Glenda. Is this the time West learns playing nice dictators is not a viable solution, considering issues of Turkey, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Libya, BRICS? Are we in a world war already? I don't think we're in a world war already, but I think there is a contest going on. Sure, Mac, you almost made me swallow the um, iron brew down the wrong tube. Oh, we can, yeah. <laughs> My theory on the RN needs anti-ship missiles. Yes, they do. I mean, lots of oil and gas leases on federal land going unused. Ten years ago, the USA industry drilled. Uh, USA's uh, this is industry drilled themselves to bankruptcy as oil and gas prices collapsed from overstock. That's why lessons learned. Hmm. So does, I don't see the point of replacing a 9-ton CVRT with a 40-ton Ajax. The point of CVRT was to be air-supportable by tactical lift. A C-130 or I-4 and can carry, cannot carry Ajax. I would point out Ajax has something like 1,500 critical points it's got to meet and probably in about another same amount which, it's supposed to, which it would like to meet, and that's a lot of specifications. Nighthammer Productions. Uh, Nighthammer Productions. So, what do you think of the double flash in the South, um, uh, uh, South Atlantic, South Atlantic Indian Ocean was then? A joint atmospheric test of the South, uh, South African Israeli bomb? I believe it happened in the 1970s. Who knows? Who knows? Could have been something. Digital 90, how long do you think it would take to transition Ukraine over to Western heavy weaponry? There are only so many ex-Soviet weapons in NATO. Oh, you're talking six months or so. And that's if you start now. Because it's not just... Before people, people go, oh, it's the training. It's not just the training. It's also setting on the infrastructure and logistics for it. They're getting the fuel pipelines, getting everything else in place. And doing that all while not having decent logistics lines into Ukraine. You can't just air portable and drop it in. You have to actually build it. You have to actually build the supply lines, in which case we need the fricking roads and railways and everything else built. Senator in fact, a lot of Russian assets in Ukraine switch sides as soon as Russian troops step foot on Ukrainian soil. Yep. Malaga, if Taiwan has nukes, how likely are they will be able to hit any major political centers in mainland China with them? I have no idea. It depends what they are. Are they missile mounted? Are they airdropped? Or do they even exist? I don't know. All I'm saying is, I'm highly suspicious that the presume uh, that we know South Africa got them, of the three, we all presume Israel got them, to an extent it's sort of almost an open, as open secret, and yet people presume Taiwan didn't. I have no data, no proof, nothing. I have got no pr nothing to back that up. It's just based on the uh, based on the information we have on we know these three nations were involved in this program. I just 
find it highly suspicious that the presumption is the one nation which is uh, which is arguably even more motivated hasn't of the three. Let's be honest, South Africa was possibly the least motivated, because who was really going to go and invade it? Who? Really? Why are you doing these? Uh, Israel, you can see why, considering they're surrounded, and all the other things, why do we... But again, it's not as if there's a superpower but leading on them. It's basically, they are surrounded. But we will presume they got them. Taiwan, you are talking about a superpower sitting across straight from you who fundamentally believes that you do not have a right to exist and that you are basically an offshoot of them. That's motivation. Night, Sage. Take care, Glenn. See, good. If memory serves, the double flash was confirmed as a lightning strike. Hmm. Vision, Dr. C, what's the point of unknown nukes? What's the point of nukes and drones? Well, the thing is, if you admit you have nukes, then you might not get the support from America, etc. That you suspend on for your, you depend upon for your conventional military. You could evaluate and ev elevate yourself to rogue status and lose the support. But with the nukes, you can deal with a potential amphibious invasion. Rikasa, what you have said about in Taiwan and nukes makes perfect sense. Hmm. Vision, would Taiwan wait till the eve of the invasion before doing a test? I think they... Myself, I think they'd wait till there was an invasion. And then, if they have them, that's when you'll see them. Chuck, I'm also very suspicious of the US involvement in breaking up in the sense that all traditionally US allies. But maybe traditionally US allies, but US depends on being supreme, uh, supreme for its allies. It likes to be the dominant, dominant partner. And it's you can see from its worries after Britain and France in the Suez Canal scenario, it doesn't like having peer partners. Which you can understand. They, peer partners are problems. They don't do what you ask them to do. And in many ways, you could argue that the Americans' safety they've guaranteed around the world, combined with their pushing their peer partners to disband so they can't take part, has now undermined them for more because now the peers aren't prepared to defend themselves because they're so used to relying on America to do it. How long would it take China to assemble an invasion fleet? Mm, probably a couple of weeks. Vision. What if both China and Taiwan know that invasion is possible due to nukes and both are just play acting for their public and international community? Or does China think it has a way of neutralizing Taiwanese nukes and doesn't want to mention them? I have no idea. But, you know, there could be... There, all I know is Taiwan is a very high-stakes game of poker.
being played by a lot of players, none of whom know what I, know the hands of everyone else involved. The hands or the um, the hands on them or the seedlings. Sure, Mike. I also understand it, but again, the Israelis and South Africans got that in them. I wonder if the U.S. heart was actually in it. I think, actually, the U.S. ego was involved. And I think, uh, often when you look at it, the U.S. ego says they broke it up. And the question is, does it really break them up or push it to different channels? Uh, uh, Nighttime Productions. Might lose American support for conventional military. Is that why Japan has not pursued nuclear weapons? Nixon was of the opinion. Pit in 19 uh, that should uh, never agree ever again nukes in Japan will fall in suit, or is that due to personal experience with Hir Hiroshima and Nagasaki? It's a bit of the two. It's a bit of two. Um, the Chinese released a statement in the UK from the UK and the Chinese embassy in the UK just recently about one China and reunification. So they are, but they aren't. And as for China being more vulnerable to sanctions than Russia is, just remember how dependent we all are on China. For manufacturing everything. Imagine if you cut down, shut down access to China in trade, imagine what you don't have anymore. Anyway, it is now been, by my watch, very close to four hours. Very, very close to four hours. So, I'm going to say last questions. Thank you very much for everyone for watching. I'm not going to go beyond four hours tonight. Mainly because, as mentioned earlier, I'm still tired. <laughs> I was in charge of lots of teenagers for seven days. And most of my staff were teenagers as well. The tutors weren't, of course, but the course assistants, the people who assist me in running the centre, were teenagers, and they were lovely. And I loved working with them. They're a lot of fun and very nice people. But oh my lord. I was sitting there at some points going, I, we speak different languages. I have to learn this language now. And of course, if you can only imagine what the poor kids are like themselves, because the kids are lovely. But. And I say this, uh, this is one of the reasons why I like doing the centres. For many of them, this is their first time away from home, because it was a residential centre, since COVID began. In that, you know, the rest of the time they go with their families, they go on holidays and all these things. This was their first time away as an individual. And, yeah, I have to manage that. And I have to deal with that, the things that come up. And they've been stuck in for two years. And I'm so hard. When they get to university, it's going to be interesting. But, you know, they're good kids. I see, why does the US seem to shoot itself in the foot so much? Mm, major powers often seem to shoot themselves in the foot so much because they have to compare. They have to bear so many things in mind. CJ90, good night. Uh, Jack Ray, thank you. Sure, I mean, if the US is also allowed tests on their territory, We'll be able to tell where the design originated from. Night vision. Thank you, Rick of Sava. Thank you, DG40. Lantern. Imagine that sounds like running a conscript film military unit. Oh, don't get me started on that sort of thing. Thank you, Jack Ray, and happy Easter. Happy Easter, everyone. Uh, Jason, thank you. Thank you for another amazing class. 
Thank you. C.A. McDavid. Good evening. Thank you. I was asking. I was once deputy commander of scout camp in a forest. Yep. Have a good night and thanks. Yeah. <laughs> night six eight three one. Night ground hand down. Night. Uh, thank you. Juicy Susan, I'm hiding that. I, 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 oh, another member is letter through. That's fine. But, oh, uh, you have no ideas. I don't think I got, I think didn't get sleep at all. Hey guys, and Dan Freeman, Seijun90, thank you. Calvin Gasper, thank you. Go Go Lander, thank you. Phil Williams, thank you. Nighttime Productions, thank you. And John Shea, thank you. Thank you, Archer, everyone. Thank you, Delphi Seneca and Nero. Thank you, Alfie Rowe. Thank you, Stafford, Dan, and Sean. Thank you for adminning the chat and take care, everyone. I'm going to quickly do what I normally do before I shut down. I'm going to do that. Make sure that's on live chat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Stafford. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Anuk. Thank you, George Newman, Greg Salsky. Thank you, Carmen Gasberg. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please do like, share, and subscribe if you like. And yeah, there, there is a lot of fun stuff coming up. There's a lot of interesting work going on. And well, yeah, I'm looking forward to June right now. Making sure I have enough money to buy the books I want to when I'm over there. That's what all the work for Justin Craig, etc., is for. So I can treat myself to lots and lots of books in Canadian stores. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care and have a nice evening. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And one final thing before I go. One little incy bincy final thing. I want to say thank you again to everyone who's helped me in getting ready and sorting out for Canada and all the stuff coming up on that trip. We are going to be putting out finalized details of where we're going, what we're going to do. And as I've said before, and I think uh, uh, Drak and me have discussed in Bilge Pumps, in last Bilge Pumps, I'm going to be flying cross on the second. So I'm going to be there. Uh, uh, the reason I'm getting there earlier on the third is so, uh, so for the third because I get some time aboard HMCS Hyder on my own that day, do some fielding, which is lovely. I only am allowed on, but that's going to be fun. Then I pick up everyone else from the airport, and so I have to drive back to Toronto Airport, uh, to Toronto Airport to pick them up. And so we're probably organising a bit of a dinner. On the third in the evening, as a hello, we're in Canada thing. If people would like to take, uh, come to that one, and then I'm hoping there's going to be a proper dinner on the fourth. But the fourth is when we're going to be doing filming on Hyder. And again, if people want to come see us, me and Drak are going to be there. Hopefully, Dan Freeman and our support team will be there, and we'll be uh, able. Everyone who wants to will come and see, uh, come. But come tour Haida, you'll see us wandering around doing video, and we'll be happy to chat with you, and we're really looking forward to it. And we're going to be announcing the further dates as we go along. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care and have fun.